Hey guys. This is part 6 of what if Naruto was in Bloodborne. Hit like and subscribe if you like this one and also please check the author in the description. Let's start. We are pain, that's all. We are God. <laughs> Chapter 17, Mentor and Sensei Hinata, Kiba, and Karen elected to follow Jiraiya and Naruto to where Kakashi was, which was apparently the hospital. In the foyer they found Sakura there with Kakashi and Sasuke, the Hataki raised an eyebrow at Jiraiya. I figured it was quicker to get you to verify my identity than to go find my ninja registration, Jiraiya confessed. Kakashi raised his Hatai to reveal his Sharingan briefly, no henge. That's Jiraiya of the Sanin, all right. He introduced to the two genin who had yet to meet the man yet, say, Could you autograph this book, by the way? He asked casually as he pulled out an Aika Aika copy. Naruto turned paler, You wrote that smut? He asked, Why the hell do you call a penis a member? I don't get it. He asked crassly. Sakura and Hinata both turned bright pink as Sasuke and Kiba stared at the blonde with the surprise. The nurse at the front desk glared at the group as Kakashi and Jiraiya both looked at Naruto. It's called using subtle language and metaphors, euphemisms and synonyms. Jiraiya explained professionally despite the topic. Sakura looked a mix of disgusted and dismayed that two of three of some of the most legendary Konoha shinobi were such creeps. I have no idea what you just said but I do not like your long words. Naruto snapped in response. So you did read it? Kakashi asked, and the smirk under his mask was audible in his voice. Enough to know not to finish it. Naruto retorted derisively, cheeks pink with embarrassment and anger. But up until the smut the story was pretty good, right? Kakashi asked, enough to get you to get up to the smut. I know for a fact it doesn't start straight away. Jiraiya-sama likes a good build-up, world-building, and getting to know the characters before they get intimate. He insisted. Kiba had not been ready for the day when he woke up, and Hinata had gone bright red and was now staring at a spot on the floor between her feet with great intensity. The Inazuka wondered if becoming stronger just naturally made people weirder. Naruto had always been a little weird and he apparently had more chakra than anyone in the village technically. Karen sighed, this is so far off the topic I expected. She complained, can you check the Fuin now? I'm an Iria ninja, I know almost nothing about Fuin Jutsu. She added with a huff. Jiraiya raised an eyebrow. Uzumaki without Fuin Jutsu? He asked. I can make Kibaka Fuda. Anyone with basic chakra control can figure out Keifu no Jutsu. Karen excused and at the second name Naruto recalled how he had figured out that one on his own. And I can perform Funio no Jutsu. She finished and the blonde had no idea how to do that one. I want to make Kibaku Fuda. Naruto decided immediately. That might be the edge he need against monsters like Gara or that thing with antlers. Kakashi considered that, HM, well, I need to get Sasuke Kuen trained up so Gara doesn't turn him into a red smear or cripple him worse than Lee. He mused and the Uchiha glowered, and I only have one Tokajon and I can pull in a favor for this. He added, looking between Sakura and Naruto before his sole visible eye fell meaningfully on Jiraiya. The white-haired Sanin scoffed. You want me to autograph your book and help you train one of your students? He asked incredulously. I'm always happy to sign something for a fan, but I'm too busy to teach some dumbass how to do fuinjutsu. He pointed out. I can probably show you how to make kibaku fuda. Karen muttered to the blonde, who nodded. Yeah, give Sakura-chan the tokujonin. Naruto decided he was pretty sure she needed it more. Sakura could guess why the blonde had deflected the unknown Tokajonin to her, and while she was a little offended she was also silently grateful. She was also disappointed not to be getting personal training from Kakashi, but she had to admit Gara was absolutely the most terrifying genin to face in the final phase. Kakashi raised an eyebrow, you're going to let another genin show you the basics and just wing it from there? He asked and when the blonde nodded confidently the jonin looked to the Sanin. Jiraiya turned pale as the implications of a Jinchuriki unsupervised messing with Fuinjutsu. Amateur experiments were dangerous enough when not created by weapons of mass destruction. You know what? My schedule just cleared up. He said, perhaps a bit too quickly, I'll consider training you for this final phase. 
I don't know much Uzumaki Fuinjutsu but I can show you some basics if that's what you want to use. Sasuke frowned. You're going to blow Niji up? He asked dryly. Naruto snorted. Nah, he denied. But Fuinjutsu seems useful anyway. I already know how I'm gonna beat Niji. Sasuke smirked. Good. We can fight in the second round then. He said confidently, oddly eager to fight his own teammate. Can we focus on the Fuin that Anuknin layered on the Fuin containing the Yoko? Kiba requested, his voice had a pleading tone with it. Naruto supposed he couldn't blame the boy for being terrified. The Kyubi no Yoko was considered a sentient, hateful, natural disaster. Jiraiya nodded, right, right. He agreed, take your jacket and anything under it off. He ordered the blonde Uzumaki bluntly. Naruto frowned then looked at Kakashi who nodded, the boy grumbled but took off his jacket and removed his shirt in the hospital foyer. Not even a scar? Kiba asked incredulously, Uzumaki thing or dash? He asked. Both. Naruto interrupted quickly. Okay, now mold some chakra with your eyes closed. Jiraiya said and the blonde closed his eyes as he made the ram sign. Kakashi subtly moved to block passerby views of what was happening. Thankfully there was not much foot traffic and the nurses knew who Naruto was even if they didn't know him personally. The genin, besides the blonde himself, all watched as the Fuin appeared. It had the spiral in the center and eleven spokes. But none of them had the expertise to understand that but the Sanin, Gojo Fuin, good to see his Fuin Jutsu is as sloppy as ever. Jiraiya mused casually as he put his right hand behind himself and gathered chakra. An odd-numbered fuin like that over the even-numbered hack no fuin shiki is going to wreak havoc with your chakra control. He mused. It is? Naruto asked with a closed-eyed frown. He had not even noticed much of a difference. Although he did find it a bit harder to perform ninjutsu lately, he decided he should probably pay attention to changes like that in future. Oh yeah, this should fix it. Jiraiya promised before slamming five flaming fingers of his own into the same spots Orochimaru had struck, Goji Okayan. He declared as Naruto doubled over in pain. The triumphant smile of the Sanin dropped as Naruto shuddered and when blood-red chakra rose up Jiraiya's eyes widened in panic, but to the surprise of both himself and the other present Jonin it quickly retreated into Naruto's shivering form. That hurt. Naruto growled at the old man with the nose piercing with a glare that promised vengeance. Strangely his pupils were back to normal. Try doing a ninjutsu, you'll find it easier now and you're welcome. Jiraiya retorted, deciding not to comment on how strange that flash of red chakra had been. Naruto considered it, then he decided to make a pair of basic bunshin. To his surprise not only did it work, but they weren't static, he managed to get them to appear lifelike and he could even make them move. Whoa. He muttered. You pick the most basic bunshin? I heard you can do kage bunshin? Jiraiya asked with a raised eyebrow. Kage bunshin is easy. Naruto retorted enthusiastically. I actually made regular bunshin work. You have no idea how big of a deal this is for me. He laughed triumphantly. If you shinobi are going to train and make a ruckus, please leave. The nurse at the desk said sternly with a glare at Naruto who sheepishly calmed down and dismissed his bunshin. Sasuke nodded in agreement, silently urging Kakashi to get a move on with a look at the jonin. The Hataki sighed, Sakura-chan, if you go to Hokage-sama and ask for the tutor I organized, he'll know what I mean and introduce you too. He requested a bit guiltily. Sakura nodded, sure, take care of Sasuke-kun. She responded with a slightly demanding tone before the two left, then she went to go to the Hokage Tower. All right, come on Naruto, let's see what we can figure out for you this month. Jiraiya mused casually as he turned to leave. Naruto shrugged and waved to Karen, Kiba, and Hinata before he moved to follow. Karen glanced at Kiba and Hinata, so, you two want to hang out or something? She offered, she didn't really know anyone and while Kiba was a bit rude he seemed to get along with Naruto. Kiba shook his head, nah, you two girls have fun. He said before turning and leaving. Jiraiya lead Naruto to a training ground at the edge of Kanoha, towards the wall and near some waterfalls not too far from the hot springs or the monument. As soon as he decided they were in a good spot he turned on the blonde genin with a stern expression and his arms crossed. All right, how much have you used the Kyubi's chakra? He asked seriously. 
I have no idea, Naruto answered honestly. Jiraiya raised an eyebrow and cocked his head to the side. You don't even know? He asked, have you felt it before? He asked. Naruto frowned and closed his eyes as he tried to think. I guess the kitsune must be making my Uzumaki healing work better. He stalled for time as he tried to figure out what the difference would be between feeling the Kyuubi's chakra and his own inhuman abilities from the old blood. Kid, Jiraiya began seriously. Almost as soon as I took the few in that Orochimaru put there off he used his chakra. He explained and the boy widened his eyes at the news. Also your pupils stopped being slit. He added, he didn't want to say that wasn't supposed to happen but he could tell from the way the blonde flinched that the genin knew. Orochimaru must have screwed up or something. Naruto grumbled the excuse. Jiraiya knew it wasn't true. He was an expert in the field of fuinjutsu, and the slit pupils had been weird. Weirder was Naruto drawing on enough of the kitsune's chakra to see visibly before returning to normal. He knew it wasn't Orochimaru's work, or a side effect of an odd-numbered fuin layering an even-numbered fuin. Something strange had happened. Well, whatever the case, Jiraiya set the issue aside for now. He got the sense that the boy himself didn't fully understand either. You think you have a way to take out Niji after seeing him fight once and a single night to sleep on it? He asked. Naruto nodded, Taiju Kage Bunshin. He answered bluntly. Jiraiya blinked at the casual mention of using Kinjutsu. That's... He cut himself off and hummed as he considered it. Actually, that's crazy enough to work. He mused, how many can you use? He asked. Naruto had no idea so he shrugged and made the hand sign. I dunno, you took that dumb fuin off me so let's find out you know. He said before molding his chakra, the entire area became a cloud of smoke. Jiraiya was blinded for a moment, but when the smoke cleared his eyes widened, the actual number was hard to tell. But it was easily in the thousands. Oh, and they're all physical. He muttered. The bunshin popped and Naruto staggered. Oh right, careful with the kinjutsu. He grumbled as he clutched his head. Jiraiya was pretty sure almost anyone in the world would be dead attempting to make half that many kage bunshin. So, you're going to overwhelm him with sheer numbers? Jiraiya asked. Nah, Naruto denied. That's just to show how many bolas I'm going to throw at him. He explained. Why not just use Kage Shuriken no Jutsu? Jiraiya asked with a raised eyebrow. Nani no Jutsu? Naruto asked with a raised eyebrow. How did you dash? Jiraiya began before he shook his head. Never mind. It's the same hand seal but focused on your thrown weapon. You need some of your chakra in the weapon too so it's technically harder. He explained. Naruto's grin stretched across his face. Oh I am going to destroy Niji. He bragged before he threw his head back and laughed a little too maniacally. Didn't you want to learn Kabaku Fuda? Jiraiya asked. Oh right, Naruto said teach me. He demanded with an eager grin. Jiraiya rolled his eyes. How about some respect? I'm a Sinin too for your information. Naruto frowned. Please teach me, Erosenin? He requested. Jiraiya's eye twitched. Good enough. He grumbled. The first thing to understand is that it requires a very fine control of your flow of chakra into the ink, so honestly it's concerning you were amazed to perform Bunshin. He explained, so to start with, have you ever walked on water? No. Naruto answered immediately, how do I do that anyway? I saw Zabuza and Kakashi-sensei doing it too. Jiraiya paused, Zabuza Momochi? He asked and the blonde nodded, the Sinin was baffled the boy had seen something like that already. Wow, well, anyway that's what I'm teaching you. It's similar to tree walking. He explained. Why is every chakra control exercise but the leaf one useful? It's training wheels for tree walking. Jiraiya answered dismissively. Although doing it on top of other training is still good for focus. He added before continuing, so, with water walking you want a more constant flow. He explained. Naruto looking at a nearby source of water and made the ram sign until his feet glowed yellow. Then he leaped onto the surface of the river and sank in up to his ankles. Technically it worked slightly. However he lost balance as he hadn't expected to sink, plus the amount of chakra and the running water threw him off balance to send the blonde under the surface. The young genin came up a moment later with a glower. He could stand on the riverbed with the water up to his shoulders although the running water pulled at him a bit as pulled himself back up onto land a bit downstream of where he started. 
It had taken Naruto all day to finally manage to stand on the surface of the running water, judging from Jiraiya's expression when he finally succeeded that had been impressive. Of course the blonde had then attempted a handstand and dunked himself head first into the water, but he'd lasted a second before the dunking. When Naruto returned home he found Karen and Hinata, the redhead nudged the pale-eyed girl and the blonde boy tensed with alarm. He worried Karen had convinced the Hyuga to give a confession, a confession the boy was not sure how to respond to, he didn't want to lead the girl on or accidentally hurt her. naruto Kun, Hinata began shyly, clearly having trouble finding her nerve, I'm not sure how long your jacket will take, she said and Karen gave the other Kunoichi a stern look, but I wanted to thank you. Thank me? Naruto asked incredulously. Why you never gave up, and you endured a lot. Hinata said without looking up, I saw, probably not everything, but what I saw was, well, I mean, it was worth looking up to. She continued, I know it didn't turn out great, but well, you, um, inspired me. She confessed, both Jen and red-faced, so I would like to be your friend. She requested with a bow. Naruto felt all the tension leave his body. Friend was good, he could do friends, friends sounds nice. He said happily. Hinata nodded, still red-faced, and retreated from the scene. So what did you say to her? Naruto asked once the Hyuga was gone. We had some girl talk, Karen answered vaguely with a shrug, figured out she more admired you than anything, if she has a crush on anything it's an idea of you she might have in her mind, but I'm not a head doctor. She explained flippantly, I got your back, Aniki. She finished with a smug smirk. Naruto returned the smirk with a genuinely grateful smile. I appreciate it, Emuto. He retorted. You are shorter than me. Karen snapped, Come on, I'm being so supportive. I deserve to be Onisama. She demanded hotly. Naruto rolled his eyes, Oniten. He teased. Karen flushed, That's not a real word. She insisted angrily. Fine, Naruto huffed before he smirked, Karen Kachin. No. Naruto decided he liked Karen and Hinata, they helped him feel a little normal. Family and friend, he supposed his team were supposed to be friends too but Karen was different. Karen was Uzumaki too, she even helped cover what she thought was stolen kinjutsu. The blonde Uzumaki felt bad for lying, but he had no idea how to explain what was going on with the old blood. He didn't fully understand it himself, even reading the journals had given him differing ideas few of which were negative granted, but he still couldn't actually make sense of what he was. Naruto did not even know if he counted as a human anymore, he bled and felt pain, but he couldn't die. Normal people could die, Shinigami took anyone who died. Maybe the blonde would die someday, but as long as he could dream he would not die even if he was killed. Even Naruto knew that was weird, he had not needed to have his intelligence, or wisdom enhanced by magical blood to know that resurrection was not natural. Given what he had seen, experienced, and learned, the boy could not help but feel like a predator clothed as prey when he tried to act normal. Naruto's thoughts were set aside as he entered the dream, not intentionally but because his attention was caught by the shisha, the little things had a box for him apparently. A long box, rectangular. Naruto opened it, no one but him and the doll inhabited the dream apparently. Inside the box was a wide-brimmed hat on top of some folded clothes. He realized they were similar to what the old man who had given him the old blood in the first place wore. Although thankfully they looked cleaner, and a bit darker in shade as far as the blonde could tell. Naruto frowned since he liked orange, but he had to admit enclosed boots and a long coat did seem appealing for the depths where his mobility was already restricted. However Naruto did not exactly feel comfortable changing his clothes in the dream. The doll was right there watching. He supposed he could use the shack, and mercifully the doll did not comment on the blonde boy taking some privacy to try on his new outfit. The outfit itself consisted of a bit more clothing than Naruto was used to wearing, some of it leather, and it was even reinforced with metal as far as he could tell. The pants and boots were a simple enough affair, but there were two shirts with the coat, and even Naruto could tell it was a three-layer affair. Eventually Naruto was fully dressed, the white shirt was entirely covered and despite being mostly leather on the outside it was surprisingly comfortable, with some kind of red fabric as the inner lining of his coat. 
The coat itself had a built-in mantle that was a darker shade and stiffer material than the rest of it. The blonde guessed it was armor. The hat was the hardest to Naruto. Sure it kept his hair out of his eyes, but so did his hitaite, and his hitaite did not obscure his peripheral vision. Eventually he got the hat to sit in a way that didn't bother him after fiddling with the brim. One of the belts was obvious and helped keep the pants up, but the smaller belt and the larger belt left Naruto confused as to their purpose. He strapped his weapon holster to the first belt on his right hip and his tool pouch on the back of his left hip, then took the other belts out to the doll with him. Hey, what's this belt for? Naruto asked curiously, holding up the smaller belt. Samurayoshi came to believe that bad blood creeps up the left leg, the doll answered simply, so they would bind that leg with a small belt. Just in case, she answered. Naruto decided to strap the belt to his left leg, just in case, and strapped his shuriken holster to the belt. Which only left the third and bigger belt, what about this one? He asked. That is a bandolier. The doll answered, it goes over your torso and can carry small tools like blood vials. She explained. Naruto looked at the belt and saw it did have small built-in holsters, so he put it over his head like a sash and let it hang over his new coat from right shoulder to left. Naruto put a couple of blood vials in the bandolier to test out how it worked and was surprised at how well it held them in place. Even if he went into the shack to walk onto the ceiling they didn't drop out. The blonde ran a quick lap around the dream while jostling himself intentionally to get used to the new clothes and confirm the bandolier did indeed hold things firmly in place. As Naruto stalked the depths that night he appreciated how surprisingly quiet the boots were, they also weren't as heavy as they looked. As he explored the area around where he met Maburoshi the blonde saw a light source moving and hid, the journals had said that those were almost always bad news. The blonde genin hugged the wall and crept along to the corner before he peeked at the source. As soon as he did he jolted back as he met the eyes of a humanoid beast with fur and elongated limbs. Even the neck of the creature was lengthened. The thing swung a cleaving blade that Naruto had already avoided by jolting away from the corner, but with a growl the humanoid thing came at him. The blonde readied his nokojuriboko and waited for the next swing. As soon as his prey attacked the blonde genin lunged under the wild swing and tore open the right side of the humanoid monster with the saw-toothed edge of his weapon, then he swung again in the back right leg of it to bring it low, and swung a third time into its back and the thing dropped. The haze of the chi no ishi flowed into Naruto as he sighed with relief. As far as he could tell the wide-brimmed hat indeed had not gotten in the way so he would could it. Naruto picked up the torch before the flames could sputter out. As far as he could tell the Yaja beneath Kanoha did not like fire so it was a good tool to have sometimes. The fact that monsters living under high no kuni feared fire was not lost on Naruto. He wondered if the name of the place and the development of Katan no Jutsu had ever had anything to do with the monsters in the depths. However it seemed the old blood was not common knowledge. Ninja had become Ryoshi before him, but they apparently left behind being a shinobi. Naruto wanted to talk with Maburoshi about that. He had been a bit dumbfounded when they first met, but he knew the woman could answer his questions and maybe even help him. Another thought occurred to the boy, however, the thought that while Ninja had become Ryoshi before the number of those who had also been Jinchuriki was likely in the single digits if it had ever happened before at all. Immediately Naruto realized what meeting Maburoshi had suppressed and the path his mind was going down. He was lonely. The blonde had more friends than he'd ever had, a gen and cell that were dysfunctional but still his, and even a family member. Despite all that he'd gained, the blonde genin knew why he felt so lonely. I'm one of a kind. Naruto muttered, normally those words would probably make someone feel confident and unique, but the blonde boy didn't relish seeing fear in other people. The blonde genin was pulled from his morose thoughts by the sound of a bell. He tensed at the sound as that was not the same ringing as his silver bell. After a moment he heard something coming his way. When it turned a corner his eyes widened. It was like one of the desiccated husks, but more alive somehow. A red mist clung to it, and as it turned to see Naruto it charged with a speed none of the desiccated husks before displayed. Naruto braced himself for a fight when he heard another ring of the same bell from the same direction. The blonde genin recalled that the journals mentioned an iron bell that called nightmares. He holstered his nokojuriboko, dropped the torch, and crossed his fingers in the bunshin seal, 
putting a wall of Kage Bunshin between himself and his prey. Naruto figured it was as good a time as any to test out his latest strategy, and each Bunshin withdrew their pistols, took aim, and squeezed the triggers. With ten clicks nothing happened and two Bunshin were dispelled by the charging nightmare thing. It copies the gun that can draw out blood for ammo, but it can't copy the quicksilver bullets. He muttered dryly, All right boys, shuriken it to death. He ordered the remaining eight as he leaped back to avoid a flurry of swings from the husk, which kept swinging even when he wasn't there despite not hitting anything. The second husk was on its way as Naruto's kage bunshin peppered the first with shuriken, then Naruto heard another chime of that same damned bell. The blonde frowned, he was confident in his stamina but for all he knew that bell he was hearing could summon those things indefinitely. Then he felt some chi no ishi go into him as the first husk disappeared into white mist, it had bled up until that point too. Naruto hummed as he considered that, so his bunch and kills counted for him, and on top of that nightmares had blood somehow. Naruto made two more kage bunshin, charge in groups of four. He ordered the eight remaining of the first group he made. There was some disorganization as the plan had formed after they had but the group managed to split themselves before the next husk arrived and the third rounded a corner. Naruto's confident smirk faltered when the second granted less chi no ishi, the third even less, and it faltered entirely when the fourth granted nothing. The blonde pouted and followed his charging bunch into the source of the ringing, an old blind woman, tall and dressed in a dark yukata under a hooded mantle that was pulled up over graying hair. The woman rang the bell again, and the red glow from the fifth husk was barely even there. Naruto jumped up and over the two as his bunch and destroyed the nightmare husk, he palmed a kunai in his left hand as he fell then plunged it down into the base of the old woman-shaped monster's neck. Damned Yaja. Naruto groused although he was more annoyed his attempts to harvest a bunch of chi no ishi had been thwarted before they began. He took the opportunity to check out how his outfit looked on his kage bunch shin to distract himself. They were all blood splattered, but Naruto had to admit the outfit did actually look pretty cool. It just took longer than he liked to put on but it also seemed the blood dripped from it fairly easily without staining. He decided to keep the outfit specifically for hunting, showing the outfit to Shinobi would raise questions he couldn't answer. Naruto did decide he should probably get some Shinobi armor to go with his regular clothes though, not that it would be much use against Niji or Gara. Maybe that was why Ninja didn't bother with armor as much anymore? The next day Karen went shopping with Naruto, He'd forgotten to get his new weaponry in the excitement of a new sensei so he picked that up while he was out. He didn't see anything like the mantle or bandolier, and flak vests were outside of his price range besides being given to Chunin as a graduation gift traditionally. So Naruto just got the weapons, armor wouldn't help much against Niji or Gara, and wouldn't be needed much against anyone except Hanbei anyway. As he was deciding between Kuzurigama designs Tenten stepped up besides him, normal weapons, she asked. They're useful. Naruto retorted before his eyes widened. Oh, hi, he muttered, uh, you okay? He asked. Tenten scoffed. I'll live, not even crippled. She said the second part a bit more sadly. Naruto recalled the injuries Lee had sustained, for people we're supposed to have treaties with, those Suna Genin are jerks. He grumbled and the Kunoichi nodded. Then the blonde recalled she wanted to know if he had any other ideas for weapons, actually. I do have an idea for a weapon. He changed the subject. Not sure how quick I can make it or if it'll help against any of them, but... What's your idea? Tenten interrupted eagerly and impatiently. Naruto smiled at the enthusiasm. Uh, well, it's a cane, but made of flexible blades and like a cord in the center to keep it all together. He explained. Tenten blinked olishly. What? She asked incredulously, flexible blades and you want it to be both flexible enough to be a whip but stiff enough to be a cane? She clarified and the blonde nodded, I have no idea how to do that. She confessed. Naruto frowned and decided he should read more in the dream before bringing the cane, he need a solid explanation for how he got it working this time. It was also a bit trickier to use than his noko jiraboko anyway. Anyway, Tenten began. So I heard you're up against Niji in the first round? She asked as Naruto picked out a Kuzurigama that had a comma on both ends of the chain. I don't envy you. He's a Taijutsu prodigy so you should avoid getting close to him. She warned. Can he do that Hashiman thing? Naruto asked. 
Tenton's eyes widened. Well, no, only Lee can do that among guys Jen and I guess. She confessed. Then he's not as talented as Lee. Naruto decided with a shrug. He might be good with Jukin, and it might be scary. But if he can't output that level of speed then he can't beat me. He said confidently, we're ninja. I'm not going to run up and start slap fighting with him. Or just engage him in his chosen specialty. I'm going to use ninjutsu and whatever tools I need to humble that jerk. It wasn't until he was done that it occurred to Naruto that he was revealing a bit too much of his strategy to someone who was the teammate of his opponent. But Tenten seemed oddly pleased. Yeah, kick that stick out of his ass for us, would ya? She asked. Naruto snorted but nodded as he wondered if he could make his own transforming weapon with a kuzurigama, or if one already existed. He finally decided on a more traditional design so he wasn't dual wielding sharp blades at all times, he wanted to be able to deal with normal humans non lethally. After finishing his purchases, Naruto went to meet with Jiraiya again, this time the man had actual few injutsu supplies. The blonde couldn't help compare it to calligraphy, which he was bad at. He did his best to keep a steady hand as he copied the array for the Kabaka Fuda while keeping his chakra flow as small as he could manage into the brush. Jiraiya watched silently from a slight distance, leaned back too as if that would help if something exploded. Thankfully nothing exploded on Naruto's first try, the Sinin was impressed, he'd expected the first attempt to blow up in their faces from what he'd heard. The old man with the nose piercing checked over the work with a raised eyebrow, handwriting could use work, but you actually did it. He praised, you made a kibaka fuda on your first try, so let's see how it functions. He ordered. Naruto took the kibaka fuda across the river, came back, and focused his chakra with a tiger seal, katsu. He muttered and the area exploded. Jiraiya knew well enough how kibaka fuda worked. First tries tended to have too little or too much chakra. You made a fully functioning kibaka fuda on your first try. He muttered, the last time that had happened had been his last student. All right, kid, try to make more of those exactly the same way. Repetition is key here so keep going until you run out of paper. If you can finish before sunset I'll teach you funio no jutsu. Naruto got to work. Unfortunately the motivation made him a bit too eager, and his second attempt did blow up in his face. Jiraiya snorted, since at least it had been a small explosion that time. On the third attempt though Naruto managed to find a rhythm of sorts. He got better at the symbols, faster at drawing them and his body became more used to the correct flow of chakra. To Jiraiya's surprise he actually did end up teaching Naruto Funio no Jutsu before he went home that night. Once the boy was gone the Sinin sighed, damn, kid's a natural with few injutsu. He mused proudly. Naruto already had blank scrolls at home, they'd originally been for taking notes in the academy, but he never did that much anyway. He also found the scroll Danzo had given him and decided to see if he could reuse it. It turned out he could reuse it, and his Noko Jiraboko was stored safely away. The blonde grinned, showing up without his weapon might end up being an intimidation tactic in itself. He put his new Kuzurigama in its own scroll, matched up the bolus in another, and the spare chains went in a third. Four scrolls was a lot for his tool pouch, he decided to buy some smaller scrolls later. Maybe some scrolls that fit in his bandolier, he wondered how he could get one of those for shinobi duty it seemed useful. That night he studied in the dream and practiced his chakra control, he kind of wanted to try using the cane against Hanbei if the older genin beat Sakura especially if he beat her too badly, but he could find no explanation among the books he had for how the cane worked. It was just a little too advanced for to pretend he made it. The blunderbuss was a possibility, but he was definitely not taking that up to the surface. That would raise way too many questions. Kakashi probably assumed Naruto found and fixed up some old flintlock to kill Gato, and the blonde was not about to come forward and explain otherwise. The blonde boy had his plan hammered out for the finals, mostly. A lot of the plan was and then wing it but he had a rough outline of how he planned to deal with almost every opponent. Gara was the biggest problem. If worse came to worse Naruto would try to use the QB. He had no idea how but he figured he worked well in desperate situations and under pressure. Naruto decided that during the next month of training he would have a goal. The building-sized bake mono with antlers and a wolf face smelled similar to Gara. The same scent of fresh and rotted blood mixing together to create a sickly sweet scent, 
a scent that both repulsed and lured the blonde in equal measure. If Naruto could kill a daiju like that then he could kill Gara. Chapter 18 Addictive Naruto prepared carefully for his next encounter with the antler daiju, he had a pair of those strange pieces of paper that could ignite his weapon, mostly because he kept forgetting they were in his tool pouch, but having them in his bandolier had them in line of sight. The blonde also still had five blood vials and four bullets, and had finally figured out what the other bottle the shisha sold was. The doll said other Ryoshi called them kanbin. If he lit the rag with a torch, match, lighter, or flint, he could throw it, and the splashing contents of the bottle would ignite and coat the yaji he hunted with fire that stuck to them like a sticky liquid. That sounded awesome to Naruto, and he bought one to test out against the bake mano he had begun to think of as the daiju. He also wanted to test out his blunderbuss, so he carried it in his left hand with his pistol in his tool pouch. His nokojuriboko was holstered as he carried the cane through the depths. Naruto decided on a name for the cane, Nokojuritsu. It was a bit derivative but it gave his first two weapons a theme name, and in its bladed form the whip was downright serrated with how the blades tore through things. And the strange tension practically let the weapon saw his enemies from a distance to pull them towards him all while spraying their sweet blood at him. Naruto liked his new weapon, but he wasn't sure if it was a good fit for fighting a daiju. Not that he'd had much luck with the Nokojuriboko but that weapon was actually upgraded and he had more practice with it. His two spare quicksilver bullets were on his bandolier too. Some experimentation confirmed his Kage Bunshin did not carry bullets, blood vials, or strangely anything to do with the old blood like the fermented blood bottles or the blood stones. Basic weaponry it could handle fine. Naruto assumed that would be a good indicator of what Kage Shuriken no Jutsu would work on. Importantly it worked on the Bolas and Kuzurigama even when they were in scrolls, so things in Fuin were still copied. Naruto wondered if that was for the best as he considered a very important fuin, but even if each Kage Bunshin had a copy of the Kyubi in them that probably didn't matter since they didn't last very long. The blonde decided to stick with that logic since it was the least dangerous to his nerves and psyche, much like the assumption that the Kyubi was still locked up. Actually Jiraiya technically confirmed the second one, unless there was enough residual chakra to fool a supposed Sinin that reacted to the fuin like that. Naruto had no idea why his pupils returned to normal with the Kyubi's influence, unless the Kitsune was trying to counteract the old blood. The thought jolted Naruto into stillness, he was nearing the lair of the antler daiju. The blonde considered the thought he just had, why would the Kyubi and the old blood be at odds? They were both bestial, as far as he'd heard both gave him slit pupils, and both were dark powers. Were the old blood and the Kitsune opposed in some way? Was their power incompatible? Was having them both crippling his abilities with either? Naruto had no idea the true answer to any of those questions. The questions coming up while training with Jiraiya was a thought he was forced to contemplate. He had no answer for them so he had no excuse if they became an issue. It would be much easier if Mito Uzumaki hadn't set a precedent for his condition. But thankfully for Naruto the woman had died a while ago so he only had to worry about really old people like the sand aim or Jiraiya noticing there as far as he was aware. Once again Naruto found himself grateful to have Karen backing him up. He got the impression she was partially protecting herself from her former home, but he was more than happy to help with that and still be grateful for her help. It helped that Karen didn't ask too many questions or ask him to explain too much about his unnatural abilities. Most importantly the redhead was on Naruto's side. She didn't care that he stole from his village or lied to his superiors as long as he was okay. It was comforting for the blonde to have someone like that backing him up, even if she didn't know everything she still helped. Naruto sighed before he continued. He knew from experience stealth didn't work for some reason. Maybe this specific Jiaju just had a better sense of smell, but whenever he entered its chamber the antlered monster noticed him. So this time Naruto ignited his Nokojuriboko with the red resin paper before he got within range of the Daiju's senses. Flames danced along the weapon as the boy continued his approach and pulled out a kingdom. The genin lit the rag with the flames of his weapon and threw the bottle as the Daiju turned. The bottle hit it right in the face. The screech of pain from the monster was blood-curdling, bone-chilling, and downright painful to the blonde. Naruto charged as he extended his weapon and leaped and struck down with the aid of gravity. 
The staggered monster took the hit to the face and fell back further. The Ryoshi brandished his blunderbuss and fired at the head of the on-fire monster. The antler Daiju fell further back, screeching in pain and rage. Naruto leaped to snap his weapon shut over the face of the creature but it struck back and sent him rolling away. Blood burst from Naruto's side where the claws of the monster tore him open but he picked himself up. He was not feeble enough to be felled in a single strike even by a daiju anymore. Naruto did not like the feeling of his flesh pulling back together. It reminded him of how inhuman he was, how removed he was from the natural order of things. He holstered his nokojuriboko, slammed a blood vial into his chest as the daiju roared, and reloaded his blunderbuss with a spare bullet before dashing back to avoid the downward swing of the monster he fought that cracked the stone they fought on and surrounded by. The daiju roared as it followed through with more attacks, swinging its left arm in particular, the larger one, wildly at Naruto. The blonde dashed back but needed to do so again to narrowly avoid the chain of attacks from the building-sized monster. It was downright relentless as it backed him into a corner and roared. Naruto leaped and aimed his blunderbuss. As soon as it would hit the most of its head the blonde unleashed the quicksilver shrapnel into the skull of the daiju, reared back his arm and swung again. He went for the skull but the cleaving edge of his nokojuriboko struck right arm instead, and the engorged left arm of the monster tore into his stomach and launched him. Naruto rolled and managed to force himself into a crouch, but struggled to get any further up than that. He dropped his blunderbuss and slammed another blood vial into himself, but had to abandon the gun as the daiji leaped at him again. The blonde frowned, but without the desperation of a true end behind his death, or any reason to hate the daiju in particular, nor any reason to even be angry, he had no way to even subconsciously use the power of the kitsune. So Naruto was on the back foot again as he evaded the beast, and when it roared and challenged the boy struck with his blade. Unfortunately the resin paper did not last very long, but Naruto was getting the hang of how the daiju with antlers fought. It was terrifying, huge, fast, and strong, but it was of the same base instinctual intellect as most of the yaju of the depths. Naruto felt a surge of confidence and leaped for the right leg of the daiju as it lifted its arms to attack. He swung the saw-toothed edge through the leg near the knee before it could react. Building-sized monster or not, the antler daiju had anatomy, and while Naruto didn't know much he managed to force the muscles of the monster to contract in pain so it couldn't immediately retaliate. Naruto swung again and again to saw into the monster, spraying himself with blood as a feral grin crept unbidden upon his features. For a moment, unknown to the genin himself, his pupils turned to slits and the boy jumped up to grip the back fur of the monster fought. The blonde Ryoshi used his nokojuriboko, still folded, as a climbing pick and dug his weapon into the daiju as it thrashed. To his irritation the monster even tried to crush him by rolling, I'm too damn sturdy for that, you bakaba kimono. He roared needlessly to the uncaring beast. He climbed higher to pull himself up and swung his nokojuriboko to the left, through the base of the spine of the antlered monster. The daiji shuddered and Naruto swung to the right. It started to fall and he swung again to the left. After the corpse hit the ground the blonde's eyes returned to normal as the chi no ishi flowed into him, more than ever before. Naruto was surprised that he'd done it. It had been painful, and it wasn't an easy fight, but that was it. The blonde sighed with relief. The Yaju didn't dream like Ryoshi, so they weren't truly immortal. He closed his eyes and savored the moment. The air was thick with the scent of blood and of burnt flesh and fur. To Naruto it smelled like victory, and his grin didn't falter as he examined the room. The daiju itself was only guarding a door it seemed. Maybe not even intentionally or knowingly, but with it gone the blonde could pick up his blunderbuss, reload it, and continue ahead. Naruto stopped before he did and looked back at the monster he had slain. He considered trying to fashion its hide into something as a trophy, but he already had good hunting clothes, and a good idea of where they came from. The blonde boy hoped that he'd see Maburoshi again by going deeper, she seemed nice. He checked his pocket watch, he still had plenty of time and he'd succeeded. Naruto decided he deserved some ramen and continued on to check past the door in order to find a good spot to return to the dream. The first thing the young Ryoshi found was an elevator, trying it out confirmed that it went deeper, as most things did in the direction he was going. 
Naruto didn't have a map, but he did get a sense of which way went up towards where the strange umbu who guarded the entrance were, and which way went deeper. To Naruto's surprise, the first room was gated and had a couch. It didn't look too ratty either. He supposed it was probably fine to use it temporarily, and sat down to relax on the leather couch. Besides the couch the room was relatively spartan, an open albeit short tunnel lead to the elevator he used to get there, and besides that was two gates that he could see from the couch. The blonde relaxed pulled out his bell and rang it. His vision blurred and in a blink he was in the dream. He checked his newest tombstone. He noticed a candle next to each active one by now. White candle indicated active, the flame turned blue where his body was. The depth where his body was, labeled dungeon sitting room was at depth too. Naruto had no idea how the depth system worked, or how many depths there were, but that was downright disheartening. Then the candlelight that indicated his apartment on the surface turned red. Eh? Naruto vocalized with wide-eyed surprise, uh, hey, Ninjio-chan? He asked and immediately winced at the terrible nickname. Yes, Ryoshi-kun? The doll responded, apparently quite fine with being named what she was. What does the red candle mean? There is a presence with hostile intent towards you present in that location. Naruto blinked oldishly as he wondered how the hell the dream managed to figure that out when his body wasn't even there. Then he scowled at the knowledge someone who wished him ill will was in his apartment, in his home, where he used to sleep when he was normal and where he regularly kept his body when he was in the dream. Naruto readied his weapons and stormed into the flash of light that indicated his teleportation to him. Who the fuck is Dash? He began but was alarmed to find Karen and Anko wrestling in his apartment. The redhead was losing to the older Kunoichi but thankfully the woman didn't seem to want to kill the girl. At the sudden appearance of the blonde the two Kunoichi froze and stared at Naruto with stunned expressions. Anko recovered first and completed her pin. Hey, Naruto-kun, I literally can't think straight lately, so give me a fix and we can work something out, yeah? I get that it's a kitsune drug or whatever but it was really good. She bargained. Get off me. Karen snarled angrily. Naruto sighed and sat down on his futon, let Karen lay up. He demanded and the Tokajonin obliged. All right, what does that look like from your end? He asked. He did not need to clarify what he meant. You literally just started existing, Karen answered as she rubbed her left elbow. Like one second you weren't there, the next your chakra was and in a flash of white mist your body followed. She explained hesitantly with a glare at Anko who nodded to confirm it. Naruto nodded, cool, I was wondering about that. He confessed, so, uh, that's a lot more than anyone else has seen, and these clothes and this gun are kind of impossible to explain, huh? He asked. I probably would have pretended to buy whatever bullshit you said and not bothered to look into it as long as you gave me another taste of your blood. Anko confessed with a shrug as she crossed her arms. Now that you've said that, though, I am a little curious what's up here. She added as she returned Karen's glare. Well, I don't know. Karen grumbled at the older woman. Naruto sighed, yeah, me either honestly. He confessed as he dropped both his held weapons on his futon on either side of him. I guess I have leverage with one of you, and I trust Karen A, so ask your questions. He decided with a shrug. Karen was surprised, you're going to be honest? She asked. Naruto frowned, you've been really helpful, and your family. He muttered, Iryo Kinjutsu might honestly still be a good word for this. He added. Enko raised an eyebrow. Iryo Nanaijutsu? She asked sarcastically. That doesn't make any sense. Karen grumbled and the older Kunoichi shushed her. Uh, so, Naruto began before he faltered on where to begin. I somehow found my way past extra secret Umbu security into tunnels no one is supposed to know about and found the ruins of a long dead civilization that predates the Sengoku Jidai beneath Kanagakur no Sado. He already hated retelling this. They're full of Bagmano and Yaja, by the way, and the Iryo Kinjutsu is blood. He finished with a nod. Enko and Karen stared at the boy incredulously. What? The older of the two asked bluntly. That doesn't explain anything. What did the blood do? How did you get it? She demanded. Uh, Naruto began hesitantly as he struggled to formulate what he did know into a coherent thought. I can heal by taking in others' blood, and I think I might be kind of similar to a Yaju. He confessed and deflated visibly at the last part, his gaze dropping to the ground. 
I don't know why my blood is doing this to you. Maybe Karen is right and it is an Uzumaki thing being altered by the Kitsune. Maybe the same but with the Yaja blood, he wasn't sure why he didn't want to say old blood to them. Or maybe it's just the blood itself. He finished with an uncertain shrug. Enko frowned. Are you telling me that Hokage-sama doesn't even know about this? She asked. Naruto flinched and shook his head. I haven't told anyone. I've been hiding it. He confessed without looking up. He did not bring up how much he suspected Orochimaru knew. Enko gulped. Okay, this is pretty big then. She admit. You think? Karen grumbled. Naruto frowned and looked up. You had hostile intent for me. He accused bluntly with confidence. Anko winced, I just wanted some blood, I wasn't going to kill you or anything. She defended herself. Naruto rolled his eyes but decided to keep his immortality to himself. Part of this whole thing with the blood is that teleportation. I've been going back into the depths to try to figure out more and I do a lot of training down there. He explained, still not sure how to explain the dream or if he even should. Anko frowned before she crouched down, look at me. She demanded and Naruto met her eyes. What did you think of Orochimaru? She asked. Died you in human form? Naruto responded immediately. That thing needs to die. He said, dehumanizing his target in a way that left even Karen a little chilled. Anko nodded approvingly. All right, I'm in. She decided, I get some of this blood from you. No idea what it's doing but I crave more so I'll help keep your secret. She seemed finished but her gaze shifted, that being said, she continued as her right hand raised up to the back of her neck. That thing Orochimaru did to Sasuke Uchiha, I have the same thing. She revealed, I want to kill that bastard more than you know, but just being near him causes me immense pain. It's not normal fuinjutsu, it's juinjutsu. She explained. Naruto was stunned, small world, he commented as he absorbed the information, so we both want Orochimaru dead. I have something you want, and you can help me in other ways too, he asked. I can't directly train you until the Chunin exams are over, if that's what you're hoping. Enko retorted with a smirk, as a proctor I strictly can't, but I can definitely answer questions and give pointers to a fellow Kanoha ninja, she advised. I have Jiraiya teaching me few injutsu for the month anyway. Naruto commented with a shrug as he finally took his hat off, Karen had not seen him by his outfit or seen it the last time she'd been there, but he could teleport. Enko was more surprised by the reveal the genin was being trained by a Sanin. Then it clicked that the Jinchuriki of Kanoha was being trained by Jiraiya and she nodded. Oh wow, these finals are definitely gonna be worth watching. She chuckled. Naruto frowned. What do you know about Gara? He asked. Enko frowned. Hey, how good is that sensory ability? She asked. You think I'd let Naruto and I get this far uninterrupted if anyone was close enough to eavesdrop? Karen asked, her tone as insulted as her body language with her crossed arms and sneer. Enko shrugged. Well, he finished my phase on the first day. He and Cell 8 of Kanoha both beat the previous record, but the Suna Cell won by a large margin even then. She revealed, I don't really know much else. He's a weird kid, and I've never seen a jutsu like that. I heard the Kazakages had similar abilities and rumors, but I have no idea for sure which ones. Naruto frowned. The fact that controlling sand like that was legendary enough to be Kage level was concerning. The sand really did seem damn near impossible to beat, but then again so had the Daiju. The blonde considered his options. What do you think Kibaka Fuda would do? He asked. Knock it around. Enko answered plainly with a shrug. Use enough of it you might concuss him or something but from what we saw in the preliminaries you'd hurt the crowd as much as him with the amount you'd need. She explained. Naruto frowned. How does sand react to fire? He wondered. Karen and Enko both raised an eyebrow, but at the mention of it they both took notice of the smell of charred flesh and the sight of burnt blood smudged along his nokojuriboki. The older Kunoichi recovered first, you know Katan no Jutsu? She asked incredulously. Naruto shrugged, not ninjutsu, but I have tools that can burn. He explained vaguely. Heat and fire can turn sand to glass, Karen muttered, but that might just give him another weapon. She added with her eyes on the ground. Right ton, Enko declared as she punched her right fist into her left hand with a grin. Elemental Jankenpan, 
Electricity trumps dirt. She explained smugly. I can't shoot lightning. Naruto pointed out glumly. None of my tools do that. He added, although he wouldn't be surprised to find such a thing in the depths. I guess I'll just have to ask Erosenin. He decided with a sigh. What? Anko asked with a raised eyebrow. Jiraiya wrote Ika Ika and he's a Sinin, so Erosenin. Naruto explained his logic. Anko snorted. Please tell me you call him that to his face. She requested rhetorically. Yeah. Naruto answered with a laugh, not noticing the surprised look that the Tokajonin swiftly covered. That the Sanin would allow Naruto to get away with that, Jinchuriki or not, was kind of weird. Enko decided she had answered enough. Okay, so I get some blood from you? She asked. Naruto shrugged and rolled up his right sleeve. Sure, whatever. He said blandly, his calmness towards giving his blood to the older woman concerned Karen. Given permission however Enko hesitated, doing it to creep out the genin was one thing, and sure she did enjoy blood a bit, but actually cutting the kid open to get a fix like his blood was a drug was downright bizarre. Enko knew she should show restraint, that what she was doing was wrong in more than one way. Enko palmed a kanai, cut a small opening into the right wrist of the young blonde, and pressed her lips to the cut before she licked. Naruto shuddered at the sensation before he visibly relaxed, the tension left his body and his eyelids drooped. The purple-haired woman pulled back with a frown, wow, you do heal fast. She complained as she licked her lips, she watched the tension return to the blonde curiously. The Kunoichi both wondered what about having his injuries licked by someone made him subconsciously relax so much, but the best either could guess was that it had something to do with the strange blood. Naruto looked at the spot the woman had cut, I think I have like three different healing factors enhancing each other. He confessed with a shrug, he was pretty sure he had not healed quite as fast before the old blood and having the QB locked away by Orochimaru had slowed it down too. Saliva is actually good for cuts, Karen revealed as she adjusted her glasses. Maybe something about this Irio Kinjutsu enhances those instincts so someone who isn't actually trying to hurt you licking the injury calms you down. She wondered out loud. Naruto shook his head, crazy lady definitely means me harm. He argued. I do not. Enko denied indignantly. If anything I'm going to be more worried than anyone when you're out on extended missions, she pointed out, then she smirked. It'll be like I'm pining for you while you're gone. So don't die or someone will get the wrong idea when my mourning is more intense than anyone else. She joked morbidly. Naruto snorted at the dark humor. I'm sure they'll find you in my bed, searching for any leftover dried blood I forgot to clean, and get the wrong idea but you'll be far too distraught to correct them. He joked right back. That is way too likely for me to be comfortable with. Karen interrupted them flatly with a blank expression. Please stop. She requested. Enko laughed. I was trying to tease him, but you're the one uncomfortable. She mocked the younger Kunoichi. Oh well, I'll be in touch. She said as she stood up. Just to be clear, we're all still on Kanoha's side despite this. A uh, weird occult shit? She asked. Naruto raised an eyebrow at the new word but nodded, yeah, I want to be Hokage, you know. He answered as if it was obvious. Anko's eyes widened, oh. She said simply, well, shit, uh, she seemed unsure how to continue, and oddly conflicted, I guess I'll try to help with that somehow. She decided finally with a shrug before leaving out the window. Is that how she got in here? Naruto asked. I think so, Karen answered. Naruto sighed, I had that locked, I'm asking Erosenin if there are few injutsu to lock that up. He groused, thanks for confronting her. He added, glad you were here and all you know. He added awkwardly. I felt the chakra of that creepy proctor lady sneak into your room at night, Karen deadpanned. Of course I assumed the worst and I was right. Well mostly. Naruto nodded, fair enough. He agreed. That day Jiraiya had a new jutsu for Naruto, but to the surprise of the blonde it was a ninjutsu. Sort of, it was a contract that would let him use Kuchio's no jutsu to call toads. The size of the toad carrying the scroll that Jiraiya summoned told the blonde they would likely be combat effective, plus the toad actually looked capable of defending itself and that scroll. However when Naruto signed his name in blood it glowed blue and faded away, huh? He asked. 
Jiraiya looked as confused as him. That's never happened before. He muttered, he didn't even know that could happen nor could he begin to guess why it would. I'm going to go figure this out. I'll be back in a couple of days. He said. Naruto frowned as he watched the man leave. He supposed he had learned some few in jutsu. Basics, at least. The contract rejecting him concerned him, though. If Jiraiya said it never happened before then it might have to do with his old blood. Plus he hadn't gotten to ask about right on no jutsu. The blonde genin sighed and stood up. He considered the fights again. After he beat Niji was either Sasuke or Gara. From there it could be Tamari, Kenkuro, Shino, or Shikamaru, and finally either Sakura or Hanbei. Of those there was only one true threat but there were some minor threats, Gara being the obvious most dangerous genin. As Naruto considered this he spotted Shino approaching him. Naruto-san, he greeted, This may be strange but I wish to discuss something my Kikechi reported to me about you during the preliminaries. I understand if you would prefer not to answer, but please state as such instead of lying. Naruto blinked a lot during that speech, uh, hey Shino. He greeted casually, unsure how to respond to anything else. Your blood contains something my Kikechu have never encountered before, Shino began and Naruto tensed. Those who tasted it insisted that it contains perfect nutrients, some insisted I ally with you permanently, few thought I should kill you for you blood. One very confused Kikechu was under the impression we should mate, and was very disappointed to learn of the biological impossibility. Gross. Naruto interrupted blandly, no offense, but what is your question? Why does your blood do that to my Kikechu? Shino asked bluntly. Naruto considered not lying, Uzumaki trait enhanced and corrupted by Kitsune magic, he lied. You probably shouldn't let your Kikechu eat my blood or my chakra honestly. He warned, sorry if that, uh, makes it hard to fight me in the finals. He apologized. Shino nodded, it is fine. While your advantages make you a counter to my own abilities, it is a good reminder to practice my fundamentals and not be dependent on my hive. You are very agreeable. Naruto muttered, kind of long-winded though. Any thoughts on that puppeteer guy? He asked. I believe I have devised a way to deal with him, Shino revealed. However, while the method would be useless against you, I still will not reveal too much. He finished apologetically. Naruto nodded, that's fine. He waved off the apology. You aren't scouting the others? He asked. Gara is my most likely third match, Shino said, and the blonde tried not to be offended. I would have scouted Sasuke-san, but I cannot find him. He confessed. Kankuro and Temari have already been scouted, and Shikamaru-san surprised with his intelligence, but his chakra is the same as it ever was. Naruto frowned. He was confident that after the preliminaries Gara would be less likely to toy with them. What do your Kikechu know about him? He asked curiously. Shino seemed surprised by the question but quickly recovered. His chakra suffuses the sand. Even my Kikechu end up crushed by the pressure or shredded by the granules if he notices them. He explained, the scent of death clings to him, and his sand, it is like approaching a sandstorm full of malevolent intent. Naruto sighed, wow. Way to make him sound even scarier than he already is. He grumbled, but despite his complaints he was less intimidated than before. The daiju had smelled of death. Fighting it had been like trying to defend against a cave and that hated him personally. I feel I am understating how dangerous Gara is. Shino confessed. A buzzing sound came from him that the blonde could barely hear and definitely could not discern the reason for besides Kikechu. Lee heard him. Naruto recalled Lee scared him. He reminded. Lee San was also the first person to ever hurt him, apparently. Shino pointed out. Naruto shrugged. If it comes down to it, he began before he frowned and trailed off. Gara is a yaju, he just wants to kill. Now that he understands how Kanoha views that better, he won't play around as much like he did in the preliminaries. He explained if he fights me, it'll probably be because he killed Sasuke. If it reaches that point, I will find a way to tear through his defenses even if I need the QB to do it. Shino raised an eyebrow, very well then, I have training of my own to continue with. He said by way of farewell, good luck with your own training, Naruto-san. He added with a nod. You too. Naruto responded with a wave as the other genin left, he was surprised the Aburame hadn't argued against his ability. 
but he supposed after the Chunin exams his former classmates all understood his abilities a bit better, and the revelation of him holding the Kyubi no Yoko probably added to that. It was bizarre for Naruto himself, he knew it had taken a few days, closer to a week really. But his sense of time was skewed and he was witnessing the reactions at a delayed rate so to him it was like he'd gone from class clown to top genin in reputation overnight. Naruto sighed as he finally processed that everything that tasted his blood seemed to want more. It took an embarrassingly long time for Naruto to jolt an alarm as he recalled that technically Orochimaru had tasted it too. Given the lengths Enko had gone to he decided that staying in a training grounds alone after hours for much longer was probably a bad idea. Karen was glaring at Enko in the hallway, which was also sort of a balcony, of their floor at the apartment. You know blood is a biohazard, right? The redhead asked dryly. Enko rolled her eyes and waved to Naruto with a smirk. Oh relax, I don't make a habit of drinking blood, Naruto-chan is just special. She said simply. Naruto flushed in embarrassment as Karen grimaced, you're kind of gross. She told the older Kunoichi. I'm willing to pay for it, Anko said. That's why you're gross, Karen snapped angrily. Naruto, however, was interested. How much? He asked and the red-haired Uzumaki squawked at him. Don't indulge her weird kink, Karen pleaded angrily. It had an odd tonal effect on her voice. A hundred real for a sip like last night. A thousand if you let me go deeper. Enko offered and her tone made it sound like she was not talking about blood. Naruto flushed again. This is still just about blood, right? He asked nervously and Enko laughed but nodded. All right, I should have dinner first I guess so come on in. He muttered with a shrug. Karen scowled but followed to make sure Enko didn't take it too far. Naruto made himself a cup of instant ramen for dinner. The redhead stared at it. Please tell me you intend to eat more than that she requested. I'll eat more after. Naruto confirmed with a nod, although he was fully intending on just eating more cup ramen. Enko made herself at home with a smug, self-satisfied, and all too predatory smirk that made Karen's blood boil. All right, I might as well get the thousand real. Naruto decided once he was done eating, much to the surprise of the older Kunoichi in the room since she hadn't expected him to actually pick that. Don't expect me to let you get that every time though. I still need my blood. He warned. Enko decided not to question her luck with the surprisingly masochistic, or maybe just overly mercenary, young blonde. She brandished a kunai and dug it into his left shoulder, startling Karen with the placement. Just a scratch, right? The purple-haired woman asked with a smirk as she recalled how he'd reacted with similar words to a much worse injury. The woman didn't wait for a response, she curled down around the young blonde to sip from his blood. Karen winced, disgusted for a few reasons. She knew it was technically safe, but it still felt like breaking so many taboos. Humans weren't meant to drink blood, and adult women weren't meant to treat boys Naruto's age like that. Enko was surprised however to find she felt less in control than she expected and she could tell why. Naruto was oddly firm, he shivered when she licked his open wound and relaxed beneath her but the woman could do little to actually move him. So the purple-haired Kunoichi sated her fix and pulled back with a content sigh as she licked her lips. She wouldn't say it was better than alcohol or similar, but it did give her a pleasant high. She took a deep breath and laughed, thanks, see you around. She said before she handed over ten notes, each a hundred rio, and turned to leave so she could enjoy herself while it lasted. Karen huffed, you shouldn't indulge her. She warned. Naruto shrugged, I feel fine even after that I'm tough. He insisted as he counted his money. Compared to what he made on C-rank missions it was change, but it made up for his lack of D-ranks lately thanks to the Chunin exams. Mostly he'd accepted because he wanted to buy more ninja tools, and eat at Ichiraka more often. Chapter 19 Medicinal Naruto blinked at the new toad. His last two nights had been rather similar. Enko came by to get her fix traded information, and offered what little assistance she could. Unfortunately pointing out that Kakashi was the premier right and no jutsu specialist in Konoha, as the only one besides the Sandame who even used the element, did not actually help much when said Jonin was training Sasuke somewhere undisclosed. So the blonde boy had been effectively without a sensei, so he'd just eaten at Ichiraku with his blood money, 
and trained himself in the depths further. He decided to finally upgrade his blood hinge, just to see if Anko would comment on the taste. The toad blinked back at Naruto, so this is him, Jiraiya? The toad asked, stroking a goatee. Naruto didn't even know toads could have hair, let alone eyebrows and a goatee, or ride around in a seat on bigger toads, or wear gray cloaks. Yes, Jiraiya answered, Naruto Uzumaki, meet Fukasaku, Myobo cousin no Kashira and one of the Naide Zengama. He introduced. Fukasaku nodded, HM, as I thought, a prior contract clashes with ours in some way. He revealed, we don't get along with the Hibi, Taka, or Sasori, but their contracts wouldn't have the ability to do what Jiraiya described. He pointed out, which leaves a predatory tribe we don't know of, I doubt the Sara would have done it since we get along mostly. He mused. Jiraiya frowned, he considered what he'd been told, and what he'd learned through espionage, did Danzo Shimura make you sign something in blood? He asked straightforward. Naruto frowned, all right, stop, before you start acting like Kakashi-sensei and demanding to check me over for Fuin, why does everyone think Danzo did something? He asked, he helped me out, but I know I'm no good with Genjutsu so it's a little concerning that everyone's acting like he would have done something to me. He explained. Jiraiya blinked in surprise, oh, uh, well, sorry, but you should be scared. He said apologetically, Danzo is a war hawk. He used to be on the Kanoha Council but Saratobi Sensei kicked him off. I don't know what finally made the old man do it but I agree and would have done it sooner. He explained. Naruto continued to frown. Okay, well, why would he give me a contract with something and then not explain Kuchio's no jutsu? He asked. Jiraiya opened his mouth to answer but then closed it. Told you so, Jiraiya. Fukasaku said smugly, the motive lines up, but nothing else does. He pointed out, besides which, we're barking up the wrong tree so to speak. No contract with any of the Senkimono tribes would react like that. We just get up at each other politically. The Sara might be capable of a prank like this but it isn't their style. He explained, nope, this is the realm of yokai, Bakemano, and Akuma. He finished with a firm nod. Is not. Naruto denied petulantly as he crossed his arms. I'm afraid it has to be. Fukasaku said apologetically, an Akuma of some kind might have tricked you into signing something in blood and used Majinjutsu to alter your memory of the event. He explained, we need a Yamanaka or someone with different expertise to me to know what they did for certain, but I'm a Naide Zengama for a reason. He said with a huff, I can feel out natural energy, the flow of life around us. He spoke and Naruto's heart skipped a beat as his stomach felt like it was trying to turn into a knot, and I can feel that you've been cut off from that. No contract of any of the Senkimono tribes will be allowed to accept your blood. He finished apologetically. You might just not be able to Kuchios at all. Naruto considered the name of the Jutsu. It wasn't strictly the word for summoning someone to do your bidding as he had assumed from the context, but it implied a form of possession. So he shrugged. Maybe I can Kuchios a Yoko. He joked. Do not. Jiraiya responded seriously, his expression grim. Best if you never attempt the jutsu I'm afraid, Narutoya. Fukasaku warned gravely. Naruto sighed. His darkest secrets were getting closer and closer to being blown open. It was getting harder to hide, and people were making assumptions about what they vaguely understood. They weren't certain, but their warnings were still expected to be taken to heart. Teach me some other ninjutsu then. Naruto requested with a shrug, or how to counter jutsu. That sounds dangerous. He added. Jiraiya snorted. We'd have to get you able to actually counter Genjutsu. So how's your ability doing that? He asked, guessing it was probably bad. Shit, Naruto confessed bluntly. But I killed the only person who ever used it on me in a fight so I've technically beaten every Genjutsu I've encountered. He mused. How'd you do that? Jiraiya asked. His Genjutsu cut off my sense of sight, taste, smell, and hearing. Well, I could sort of hear him, but it was weird. Part of the genjutsu, Naruto began to explain, but not touch so when he stabbed me I was able to grab him and kill him. He finished nonchalantly. Jiraiya and Fukasaku both stared at the blonde, Jiraiya, your new student is crazy. The toad said approvingly, genjutsu never work on crazy people, I'm heading back to my abokuzen. He said with a laugh, 
Unfortunately, you can't teach him Senjutsu even if you break the rules. His body has been made incapable somehow, and unfortunately I'll have to request you not teach him any of the ninjutsu that involve oil. But who could blame you if he picked up our taijutsu from you? He asked rhetorically with a shrug, Sensei and students spar after all, it is bound to happen, contract or not. Thankfully either Jiraiya nor the Toad seemed to blame Naruto for his inability to sign a contract with any of the tribes that used Senjutsu. He wondered if any contracts didn't involve Senjutsu but Fukusaku had seemed to think he shouldn't perform the Jutsu at all. At least a familiar face being at Ichiraku Ramen when Naruto went there for lunch was a pleasant surprise. Hey, Iruka sensei He greeted casually as he sat down. naruto Kuin, Iruka greeted with a smile. Sorry I wasn't allowed to stay in the tower for the preliminaries, but I heard you made it to the finals. He said apologetically, then his smile became melancholic. I know it's still more than a few weeks away, but unfortunately the finals are on an academy day too. Got three students trying to be as bad as you were. He informed, saying the last part to add some levity. Naruto frowned. Oh, well, I'm going to win the whole thing anyway. He insisted. Iruka raised an eyebrow. That's some confidence. He mused. Once I beat Niji, Sasuke will probably still be tired and unable to keep up with me. But he'll be the real challenge. Naruto explained smugly. Then he frowned. Actually... No, Shikamaru might be more dangerous if I can't get around that shadow thing. He muttered, maybe Sakura-chan actually. Sasuke I kind of want to punch but Sakura-chan I'd have to pin her or something and she might get weird about that. He grumbled. Iruka stared incredulously at the blonde, baffled that of all the dangerous foreign ninja and two rookies of their respective years Naruto was more worried about losing the final round because he wouldn't want to hurt Sakura. It made the Chunin smirk softly. Well, at least you're as cocky as usual. He muttered dryly. The arrogance wasn't quite the same as the bluster the boy had in the academy, but it was nice for the Chunin to see the boy looking better than he had during graduation. First round of ramen is on me. A celebration for you making it to the finals and one step closer to the same rank as me. He offered proudly. Pork then. Naruto enthused eagerly. It was the most expensive meat, and he should treat himself. He assumed more expensive meant better anyway. So, Iruka began hesitantly. I heard your secret got out, he said and the blonde paled, among your fellow rookies at least. He clarified. Naruto shrugged, uh, how do you hear about that? He asked. Iruka snorted, Inochan trying to figure out if I already knew was how she learned most adults already know. He explained, she's oddly incensed about the whole thing. He added proudly. Naruto frowned. Ino had not seemed upset when he'd seen her last, more confused and concerned or worried. The blonde shrugged again. In my defense the first few times were not my fault. He excused. Iruka scoffed. You're not in trouble. Despite it being forbidden to talk about to your generation for us adults the same can't actually be said for you or your peers. He pointed out, that being said, tried to keep it among Konoha what you are. He requested with a smirk. So, just your rookie peers and Karen Sands so far, right? He asked. Naruto thought about it. I think Hinata-chan was technically not in the room when he began. Hinata definitely heard you. Iruka interrupted. Okay, well then, yeah, pretty much. Naruto confirmed with a nod, then he frowned again. They're all taking it really well. But Kiba and Shino just seem to treat the Kyubi like a tool I have access to. He said sadly, Kiba seems jealous. He added. Kiba is a bit of an idiot, Iruka pointed out. I taught him so I can say with confidence. He clarified, ironically though, they do have the right idea even if they don't fully understand it. He continued to Naruto's surprise. Everything I've read about Jinshuriki treats them as rare living weapons, he mused. But I guess ninja are just common living weapons. He reminded with a grin. Naruto thought about those words even as he opened his eyes in the dream that night. Ninjio-chan. He greeted the doll, what am I? He asked. Ryoshi. The doll answered plainly, a Ryoshi is a master of hunting, one who hunts with death. She defined simply. Naruto frowned at the doll, I mean, he began, but was unsure if he knew what he meant, Ryoshi are weapons aren't we? Another form of living weapon? He questioned. No. The doll answered, a weapon is wielded, a Ryoshi wields. She refuted. A weapon would be free of thought, K. 
guilt, conscience, or blame. She explained, Ryoshi cannot be free of those things. Is this not a good answer? Naruto shook his head to clear it. It's fine. He is sure though he was unsure himself. It's just, ninja are supposed to be living weapons, and because of something else I'm another layer of living weapon on top of that. He explained. The doll frowned, cocked her head to the side, and seemed to consider his words, Oh, your body is a weapon, of course. She answered suddenly, A Ryoshi must be more than his body and instincts, however. You understand this already, don't you, good Ryoshi? She asked with a smile. Naruto blinked, More than my body? He asked. The body is a shell you puppet with your mind, the doll answered, Thus is true for all Nijin. I presume ninja train their bodies to be weaponry? She asked and the blonde nodded, That does not make a weapon all that you are, you are your mind, and your mind is capable of many things. She assured, You hunt Yaju, so you are Ryoshi. Your body is a weapon, so you are ninja. Naruto was pretty sure the doll didn't get entirely what a ninja was or did despite other Ryoshi similarly being from shinobi backgrounds, but he understood what was being told to him. Thanks, Ninjio-chan. He said gratefully, Am I doing good? He asked curiously, she had called him good Ryoshi. The doll smiled again, of course, you hunt Yaju and return to dream. She said happily as if that was all it took for her, you may push yourself a bit too far with the double life thing, but I will not push you to abandon your passions for the hunt. Naruto sighed, all right, he said more to himself, time to hunt then. He said with a smile as he got up to prepare for a night in the depths. Karen waited until she felt Naruto's chakra return before she knocked on his door. She heard him swear before assuring her he would not be long. Eventually he opened the door in pajamas. The illusion was ruined by the dried blood on his face. Why are you doing this to yourself? Karen asked sadly. Doing what? Naruto asked, clueless. Do you have any idea how dangerous normal spelunking is let alone abandoned dungeons full of jaju spelunking is? Karen snapped in a hiss, but yes the blonde knew exactly how lethally dangerous it was, you've been throwing yourself solo into an S-rank mission every night I have been here, how long have you been doing this? She asked desperately. Naruto had not really considered it like that, or how it might look. His frown deepened as he tried to think of an out, come in. He muttered and stepped aside. Karen blinked but obeyed, she was curious and hopeful the blonde would explain things a bit better. Naruto shuffled awkwardly for a moment. No one is around. She said carefully. I'm immortal. Naruto confessed, the blood, the Irio Kinjutsu, whatever you want to call it, I can't die because of it. He explained, I just dream for a bit. My body pulls back together, and I can teleport my body anywhere I've slept before. Sleeping is just a bit weirder than before. Karen listened in stunned silence for a moment. Jiraiya called it the hack no fuin shiki. She recalled, Fuin Shiki? She muttered. Naruto shook his head. Convenient coincidence it might be, but it would be an excuse, and no Fuin Jutsu expert would fall for it. It's the blood. I don't even think the blood and the Kitsune are compatible. He added with a shrug. Karen decided not to ask how he got that idea since she had no context for what being either of those felt like. Is, uh, is it safe to be giving Anko your blood? She asked. She still sleeps normally and I didn't just lick some blood up or get it splashed in my face to become this. Naruto explained, his face a scowl by the end, maybe she might become like me, but for now it just seems to give her some kind of high so I say let the crazy lady sniff her glue. He muttered dismissively. Karen couldn't help but snort, you are so not glue. She muttered with a shake of her head, but whatever effect his blood had on Enko she wasn't actually sure. The older Kunoichi definitely seemed to find it stimulating, so it was an upper of some kind if nothing else and Karen doubted there was nothing else. Think she'll bring a straw next time? Naruto joked with a morbid grin. Karen sighed. No, she said seriously, she likes grabbing you way too much. She grumbled as she crossed her arms and shook her head. Besides, a straw going into you would hurt while your wounds being licked, uh, for some reason you seem to like that. She muttered the last part with flushed cheeks. Naruto frowned. It's, he hesitated on how to word it. I find it relaxing for some reason. Maybe because she's not biting me, or doesn't mean me any real harm besides her need to get at my blood. He guessed with a shrug. Karen still didn't like it. 
You realize letting you do that goes against every moral and medical ethic I hold? She asked sarcastically. Sorry, Naruto apologized. I'll buy you ramen to make up for it. He offered half-jokingly since he noticed her own tone was light despite her words. Karen scoffed. When was the last time you ate anything but ramen? She asked. Why would I? Naruto asked honestly. Karen blinked. Okay, no. I don't care how good the calorie-rich noodles are for shinobi in training or how often you get good stuff with good broth over two-minute freeze-dried ramen. You cannot just eat ramen. She refused sternly. Naruto pouted. I mostly eat at Ichiraku Ramen. They have good stuff. They do this thing called Ninja Udon where he began. Everywhere does Ninja Udon. Karen interrupted with a sigh. I'm making you dinner tonight, so don't fill up on ramen. She insisted. Naruto sighed, yes okaken. He agreed blithely, smirking at the indignant spluttering of the flustered redhead who apparently did not like him calling her that. All right, Naruto-kun, Jiraiya greeted casually. Today we're going to talk about the Yoko. He turned serious immediately. So there is a way to control it? Naruto asked. Yes, but I don't know for certain what it is. Jiraiya confessed, if you haven't felt what emotion triggers the Kitsun's will, you don't know how to initiate a tug of war over his chakra. He said plainly. Naruto blinked olishly, just how common are Jinchuriki? He asked curiously. Not common at all, Jiraiya answered with a smirk, but I've read up on Mitosama's notes, and I've worked with Jinchuriki before, so I get the gist of it. He explained. Naruto frowned. A guy with second-hand experience who gets the gist of it is the expert. He asked dryly. Jiraiya frowned back. I know it's not ideal, but I'm also a Fuinjutsu expert, so I'm the only one who understands that Fuin. He explained. Which is how I know it's been constantly leaking Kitsune Chakra into your system since you were a baby, which slowly deteriorates the Fuin over time because this is a Chakra no Bake Mano we're talking about. Naruto listened to the lecture, but the knowledge that the Fuin deteriorated shook him. Uh, did you say my Fuin is going to break down? He asked. Jiraiya shook his head. Wrong choice of words. Sorry, it's more like the lock is loosening. I have a key to tighten it back up, but for now, it being loosened might be to your benefit. If it's giving off more chakra to your system, you might be able to get a feel for it easier. He explained. So how are we going to do that? Naruto asked as he crossed his arms and raised an eyebrow. You're going to burn through your normal chakra, then all that's left will be the Kitsune chakra. Jiraiya said like it was obvious and simple. Naruto frowned as the implication set in. Are you saying that instead of chakra exhaustion I'll just eventually start to pull on the nigh-infinite power of a chakra no bake mano? He asked incredulously and the Sinin nodded. Wow, what's the catch? He asked. The Kyubi will try to take over your body. Jiraiya answered. Oh, I thought Orochimaru was trying to psyche us out. Naruto's response left the Sanin a little floored that information like that had come up. Ah, uh, well, let's see what you can do I suppose. Exhaust yourself? Jiraiya encouraged. Naruto shrugged and made the bunshin seal, then he molded his chakra. Then he molded more, glowing yellow wisps lifted off him as an aura of chakra started to lift up around him. Finally Jiraiya's world became smoke, or chakra vapor. It was more sight-obscuring than anything, although some ninjutsu made it toxic he doubted Naruto knew any of those. Speaking of Naruto there were thousands of him. Then they all dispelled and the original fell to his knees. All right, now what? The blonde asked. Hurry up, I recover fast. He added impatiently. Jiraiya was stunned. You didn't feel anything just doing that? He asked. Nope. Naruto answered bluntly. Keep throwing chakra around, just absolutely waste it. Jiraiya ordered. The blonde shrugged and obeyed. Naruto did not know much ninjutsu so he did the only ninjutsu he knew that could exhaust him. But when he made the cross seal again his vision blurred at the edges. With a blink he was in the dream, but not where he was used to. The blonde knew it was the dream because he was used to telling when he was physical and when he was a mental construct of himself, he was also used to standing on a pool of blood and starting into the eyes of a bloodthirsty monster the size of a building. Thankfully there was a cage, that the lock was a scrap of paper was concerning. That said paper said Fuin on it was a bit more of a relief. 
So, Naruto began as he looked at the shadowed form of the Kitsune, even with his enhanced senses it was hard to see in the darkness of the strange place they were in. Is this how talking to my, uh, tenant works? He asked. Jailer, the QB growled hatefully. I would like to file a complaint. The Kitsune sounded almost sarcastic. Your body is unlivable, a toxic environment, completely unnatural, and my original sentence of one human lifetime has been extended. The growl of the monster became deeper, to an eternity. He roared angrily. Naruto gulped. I was wondering about that myself. He muttered, So you're just still here then? Forever stuck with me? He asked. I doubt Shinigami-sama did this intentionally. What has happened is beyond even the power of death. The QB growled angrily, hatefully glaring down at the blonde. Uh, I'm supposed to learn how to use your power? Naruto asked as he scratched the back of his head. The Kitsune huffed, tough shit, fake it with whatever you can of the dregs that blend with your chakra or lie to cover your affront to the natural order, but expect no help from me. You need none. Naruto blinked and was back in the waking world, huh, that was different. He muttered, he decided to be honest, oh, oh, gg. The Kitsune won't share chakra with me. He declared in an annoyed and confused tone that wasn't even an act. Jiraiya frowned, what? He asked, he'd have thought the Kyubi would have jumped at the chance to try and exert some will on the young Jinchuriki. Naruto shrugged, he said I'll have to make do with dregs, he hates me. The boy stated bluntly with a nod as if agreeing with himself or confirming his own story. Look, I know I should know how to control it or whatever, but these are my first Chunin exams. He shifted topic as he shvited demeanor, can I just, I don't know, get better at basic ninja stuff, like ninjutsu? Or more fuinjutsu? Like something to help stop Gara's sand? He asked. Jiraiya frowned sympathetically, but the issue was he didn't have any fuinjutsu at Naruto's level that would help. Kekai ninjutsu, he began, I'll get you started on learning a kekai ninjutsu. He decided, locking down areas and preventing his sand from getting to you. I think I know a few jutsu that can pull it off, and I know just which one would be perfect for you. He finished with a smirk. Naruto dragged his feet home. He didn't feel like going to a Chiraku ramen. He had learned that day that he was indeed capable of physical exhaustion. It just took an absurd amount of chakra expenditure and physical exercise together to even come close to it. Once the blonde was on the second floor, Karen opened her door and waved him over. Her expression looked irritated but he was getting a better sense for when such emotions were not actually directed at him. In Karen's apartment was Anko, who just grinned like a purple cat that caught the blonde canary. Hiruchan. Naruto greeted derogatorily. Anko's eyes widened in surprised alarm, her posture tilting back away from the boy as if struck before she laughed. Damn kid, I'm just trying to get a taste of you, no need to insult me. She teased lightly. You're soliciting a minor. Karen hissed angrily. For blood. Anko specified, not too happy with what the redhead implied. Naruto sighed, I'm tired, can we eat before you take your taste of me? He grumbled, hundred real only tonight. He added. Anko nodded, I never tried to take more than you think you can handle, she said. Look, Naruto-kun, I don't want to want your blood either. She continued awkwardly. But this Junjutsu that Orochimaru put on me and your teammate, when that bastard is around personally that shit hurts a lot. Your blood is a painkiller. It actually soothes the ache somehow. Hi, she hesitated before taking a breath. Nothing has ever worked. Fuinjutsu can lock it up temporarily, but the pain? Nothing works for the pain, not even opiates. Karen stilled, her expression softening. Oh, that, uh, she stammered, shit. She cursed, you actually do need this to stand a chance against Orochimaru while he's still around. She muttered. Anko smirked, flattered and proud that the girl thought she'd be able to stand up to Sanin regardless. Yeah, she agreed anyway, because having a clear head was her best bet. So, sorry if I've been a little too casual about it, but that's just how I cope with stuff. She apologized with a shrug that was far too casual as she made herself at home in one of Karen's dining chairs. Naruto nodded, that's fine, he forgave too easily, what's for dinner? He asked the flabbergasted redhead. Karen's eye twitched, Aniki is too forgiving, she muttered sadly to herself, Matsunabe, it's not much better than what you were eating before but at least I can add some things and you're eating cabbage. 
I don't want cabbage. Naruto argued. Enko rolled her eyes. Good choice, though. The intestines will have a lot of iron. She mused. Intestines? Naruto asked. Just eat the food. Karen demanded as she dished the blonde boy a bowl, who shrugged, gave thanks for the food, and tried a mouthful of something that didn't look like a vegetable. Enko watched with surprise as the blonde suddenly tipped the bowl back and devoured the matzenade. Ha, Karen vocalized, did you like it or dash? She asked, unable to actually tell. Naruto winced and hit his chest. He had eaten far too quickly. It tasted good, a little stronger flavor than I like, but yeah, wow, I didn't know intestines could taste good, he said. It's the fat. Most of the flavor in meat is the fat, and the intestines used in matzenade tend to be fatty. Anko explained, can I get a bowl of that? She asked. You're here for blood. Karen said coldly and the tokajonin drooped. Fair, Anko sighed with a shrug. I'll just get that before my patrol. I start. She checked the time, in like a minute actually. She realized without seeming alarmed. Karen supposed it must be within shunshin distance or something. Naruto sighed. All right, let's hurry then. He said. Anko pouted. Shame, it's nicer to savor the moment. Don't you like it when we last a little longer? She asked in a teasing tone. Naruto flushed. It's embarrassing. I can't help but relax. I don't get why but you're not trying to hurt me, right? He asked. Enko blinked. Oh, she muttered, shit, sorry, like I said, I can't take this too seriously for my own sake. She apologized with a wince. Uh, no, not trying to hurt you though, just getting what I need, and grateful you're willing to trade. She added. Naruto nodded as he relaxed. So what's with the hanging all over me thing? He asked. I like riling boys up. Anko confessed with a shrug, plus, uh, she winced, kind of trying to reward you with a pleasant experience. She confessed, you don't like it? She asked with a raised eyebrow. Karen glowered as Naruto considered it. I kind of daze out when you're licking me, he confessed with a shrug. Being embraced during that daze is, uh, nice you know. He finished as he looked down, embarrassed by the entire situation. Anko grinned, you might be crazier than me. She said and the blonde's eyes snapped up to glare at her. That's good. Crazy ninja are the scariest. She nodded confidently as she said this. Naruto considered all the powerful shinobi he had met. I believe you. He said simply and the purple-haired Kunoichi laughed. Naruto fell into something of a training routine. Most nights after Jiraiya he was too tired to be bothered going into the depths for too long. The blonde was surprised at just how much exhaustion could slow down his recovery ability. It was a worrying thought. The blonde knew he technically had two avenues of recovery. He'd figured out that one passively drained his chakra to restore him. Hence why it had been slower when Orochimaru had hit him with a few injutsu, and when he exhausted himself. The other was the blood. His body absorbed freshly spilled blood like some kind of vampiric sponge and sped up his healing drastically. However, the blood only worked for his vitality, while his chakra was related to his stamina. That or he just couldn't absorb blood directly into his lactic muscles or whatever Karen had called them. Something about a naturally occurring acid in the body built up too much, and his body was flushing it. The girl seemed surprised to learn how fast he usually recovered. So Naruto rested his body a bit more. It would not do to have his body functioning below peak for the Chunin exam's final phase. It was a public tournament, and Naruto had a few reasons to want to give a good showing, his desired promotion for one thing. The blonde genin spent a lot of his rest time reading up on metallurgy, the crafting of the odd transforming weapons and how that worked. Apparently a lot of them used a magnetic metal which just looped back into metallurgy. He tried to read up on the blood and learn not much at all. The Ryoshi journals all seemed to praise the blood. Naruto wondered if he could find Maburoshi's journal but he didn't even know how the journals got there. The doll had simply told him, the little ones bring you what they believe that you need, a Ryoshi has never questioned their efficacy before so I pray they give you no reason to. The blonde looked over the journals again, scanning more closely he found that some were in katakana, they were a bit more difficult to read, but as far as he could tell they also praised the powers granted them by the blood. Ninjio-chan, who do you pray to? Naruto asked, he'd heard her use the phrase before, her hands were regularly clasped, and he'd seen her kneeling by the tombstones. 
I pray to Ryoshi that all Ryoshi may hunt well and good. The doll said happily, confusing the blonde, to the formless one who watches, and any sympathetic to hear. She explained. Naruto found at least part of that description disturbing, but he nodded hesitantly. Well, thanks, Ninjio-chan, he said gratefully. The doll smiled. You do not need to be grateful to me, good Ryoshi. What I do is safe for I am unable to help in any other way. She explained vaguely. What are you anyway, Ninjio-chan? Naruto asked curiously. Have I not said? The doll asked uncertainly. I am a doll created by Ryoshi to serve Ryoshi. She answered in case she had not. The blonde Ryoshi wasn't sure he liked that way of wording it. He worried the doll was compelled to care without true control over her own emotions, and it made him feel bad for her. Do you know how imbuing me with she know if she works enough to explain it to me? Naruto asked curiously. The doll considered it for a moment then shook her head. I am sorry, but no, she said regretfully. Naruto wasn't sure if it was a lack of ability on her part, a lack of understanding on his part, or a blend of both so he just nodded, it's okay. He assured the helpful doll. One night halfway between the preliminaries and final phase, Naruto was forced to return to the waking world from the dream as the doll warned him that two individuals were close to intruding on his resting place. The doll was usually pretty vague about that stuff, but Naruto trusted her and rushed back to his body to hear a knock on his door. Knocking hardly constituted an invasion so he sat up on his bedding, one moment. He called out, stashing the weapons he wanted hidden before walking towards the door, where he heard three people arguing in hushed tones. Naruto recognized two voices so when he opened the door he was not surprised to see Anko or Karen. The other purple-haired woman was new though but was carrying Anko. The blonde frowned at the two older women. Don't lump me in with her. Naruto looked between the two. The purple-haired Kunoichi who was an Anko did seem more professional, and also not drunk, or not as drunk at least. The blonde sighed. All right, all three of you might as well come in and explain why you're here. He decided as he stepped aside. Do you want to use my apartment? Karen offered I got new tea today. She added. I do not want tea. The new Kunoichi said dryly even as Anko enthused about how good tea sounded. The more sober of the two Kunoichi thus forced the drunken proctor into the genin's apartment. Now why did you insist this Chunin applicant was where you wanted to go? She hissed at the drunk woman she supported. Anko giggled. He can help. She insisted. He hates the guy responsible too. Four of us can take that traitor down. She slurred. Karen closed the door. Sorry, but what is Mitarashi-san talking about? The redhead asked politely. Revenge. Anko insisted before her supposed drinking partner tossed her at Naruto's futon. Hey. She protested before she fell face first into the bedding. I shouldn't have listened to her. The Kunoichi sighed with a shake of her head. She's obsessed with killing Orochimaru, and just because he's in town immediately blames him for everything that goes wrong. So now she's dragging me into her revenge scheme. She complained. Naruto frowned. What's she blaming on him? He asked. The Kunoichi winced briefly before she became as impassive as a statue. Hate Gekko was killed tonight. His corpse was found by urban patrols just after midnight. She explained tonelessly. Anko twisted to get more comfortable on the futon. Yugao-chan, she whined. Bottling up isn't healthy. Naruto-kun gets it better than you'd think. She insisted. The purple-haired woman, Yugao apparently, sneered, Oh, a genin gets it better than my comrades in Umbu or your work partners in torture and interrogation? She asked sarcastically. Anko laughed. Nah, probably not. But he's beyond being a genin by now. She assured mirthfully as she sat up. Besides... We're all against Orichibika, she added with a drunken slur. Yugao groaned, we do not know the culprit. It could just be someone working for Orochimaru. Or with Orochimaru, she ranted angrily. Orochibika is behind it regardless, Enko insisted. It's always that fucking no-good pale bastard. She grumbled as she slumped into Naruto's bedding. A moment later she was snoring. Naruto sighed. Anko chan is entirely too comfortable with me. He grumbled, unthinking of how his choice of honorific implied the same could be said in reverse. So, uh, the third exam proctor died? He asked nervously. Yugao sighed sadly. 
It probably wasn't Orochimaru, convenient target, or not it doesn't match up with the other things he apparently said. She said vaguely, Anko is just trying to drag me into some weird revenge plot. My advice, don't indulge her. Orochimaru is well above your levels. Naruto didn't disagree, but he couldn't help but think of the thing that killed him multiple times as more terrifying than the thing that almost killed him once. So the fact that the blonde Uzumaki had killed the more terrifying thing made Orochimaru less scary in a way. Still there remained an issue, so am I just putting up with her being in my bed until she wakes up or are you dragging her back to where she lives? Naruto asked. Yugao seemed to consider it sorry, but she deserves a walk of shame after this. The Kunoichi decided before disappearing with Shunshin. Karen frowned, I don't disagree, but now we have to deal with her. She grumbled. Naruto shrugged, want to make her think she did something she shouldn't have? He asked with a smirk, a mischievous expression on his face that was soon mirrored and returned by Karen. Chapter 20 Two Predators Anko felt the pain of a hangover split her skull at the sounds of birds in the early morning, not as early as most ninja needed to be up at but far too early for the woman who had too much to drink with little in the way of precautions. The Kunoichi knew she had no work early that morning so she snuggled closer to the warmth. Her next shift was evening so unless she was called for something she did not need to get up. It took a long few minutes for the barely conscious woman to realize the source of the warmth in her bed was a person sharing it then another minute for her brain to register how much smaller than her the person was. Anko tentatively opened her eyes to see she was sharing a bed with Naruto Uzumaki, who was doing decent job of pretending to sleep. Unfortunately being snuggled up to him made it much easier for the woman to tell she was being messed with, so she messed with him right back. The woman lifted her leg up and over the boy, still under the covers, to straddle him as she pressed her lips to his neck. Naruto made a strangled noise halfway between alarm and pleasure when the purple-haired woman sucked at his pulse point. The door slammed open. What is wrong with you? Karen snapped angrily. Anko lifted herself up off the startled blonde and barked out a couple of laughs before she winced and clutched her aching head. Worth it. She muttered through the pain. Also you started it. She added, the fact we're both still fully clothed is a dead giveaway. She finished dryly. You are hardly fully clothed. Karen spat. You only took my coat and leg armor and sandals. Anko pointed out. You are barely decent due to your own choice of outfit then. Karen retorted angrily. Naruto recovered from the backfired prank and finished twitching on his bedding. I thought for sure we had her. He grumbled. You'd have to actually have me to have me. Anko said with a confident smirk. By the time you're ready for something like that you'll probably be old enough that I won't even get in trouble for it. She mused as her smirk widened. Naruto frowned. Wouldn't I get in trouble for it at that point? He wondered. The woman had been very drunk last night. Only if I make a fuss. Anko answered with a casual shrug before falling back to use the blonde as a headrest, much to his chagrin. So, what's for breakfast? She asked Karen cheekily. The red-haired Uzumaki glared at the older woman before she finally sighed. Screw it, I'm making pancakes. She decided with none of the enthusiasm usually associated with making pancakes. Naruto stared at the paper Jiraiya was showing him, but he was a little too distracted. Oh brat, you pushing yourself too hard learning all this shit? The Sanin asked with a raised eyebrow. No, I'm good. Naruto denied insistently. Uh-huh. And what did I just say about what the chakra would do if your chakra was naturally aligned to the earth? Jiraiya asked disbelievingly. Crumple? Naruto asked. That's lightning. Jiraiya corrected with a shake of his head. You seemed excited about this the other day. He mused, I guess you have just been pushing too hard, although I have to admit I'm impressed with your progress so far. Naruto flushed at the praise. I'm fine to continue, just distracted. He assured. Distracted by what? Jiraiya asked and watched as his new student went from pink cheeks to red face. His expression turned sly. Something interesting? He guessed. No. Naruto lied. A prank just backfired is all. He said truthfully, Come on, I want to know what my chakra aligns to. He insisted. Jiraiya rolled his eyes but handed over the paper, which split in Naruto's grip. Wind it is. 
probably the best defensive supplementary chakra in nature. He explained. So I could use a Tezsin? Naruto asked curiously. Technically yes, but those require a refined control and a lot of practice. Jiraiya said to steer the blonde away from that. Another unfortunate note, there are exactly two Futan no Jutsu specialists in Kanahigaku no Sado. One is retired and the other is busy with his own genin. He added. Naruto pouted. Why can't I talk to the retired one? He asked. It's Danzo. Jiraiya answered bluntly. Naruto frowned as he considered that. Ha, huh, he mused, filing the information away for later just in case in the back of his mind. Well, I guess that's out. He shrugged. Jiraiya sighed. At this point, we're best refining the jutsu I have taught you for now. He told the boy, and he would privately admit it was a surprising amount. The taijutsu was still not great, but had been corrected a little so that he wasted less energy in his basics. As well as a kekai ninjutsu the young blonde boy had also managed to start learning another ninjutsu that shouldn't be too difficult before the paper had been brought in. The rest of the month became surprisingly routine for Naruto, who found that he could not handle routines so part of said routine became exploring the depths. The ever-changing dungeon beneath Kanoha provided the perfect place to train, although the blonde didn't go much deeper as he mostly went to ease his boredom during the nights. Karen seemed to think the frequency he went into the depths was concerning, but was apparently still coming to terms with the fact he was immortal. Naruto was glad she even believed him, he'd been worried she'd demand he prove it or something. Enko's visits were frequent, the woman was clearly on edge about Orochimaru being in the village. The blonde didn't actually mind, the fact she was nearby looking for the Sanin was actually comforting to the boy. An ally against a common enemy. The other purple-haired woman, Yugao, was far less frequent. Namely that she'd only shown up the one time with a drunken Anko, but Naruto had seen her one other time. Curiously, the blonde had approached. Yugao-chan? Naruto asked quietly and the woman tensed before she shot a questioning look at him. Ah, uh, the proctor, hate? How did he dash? He began to ask. Cut to ribbons. Yugao interrupted with a glare. Now, I am on one of my few breaks, Jenin, so leave me alone and stop giving away that you've seen me before. She hissed angrily. Naruto flinched and pulled away from her. He tried to remember if Orochimaru used a sword. He recalled Kanai, being shredded by his own weapon, and that the Sanin had been toying with them the whole time. As his mind went back over the fight and how it began he recalled a key detail. The powerful gust of wind that had blown him away had been a futon no jutsu. The brain of the young blonde, enhanced by arcane means and rigorous study to finally reach a level that could be considered above average, connected a few things. Naruto recalled what Jiraiya had said about how wind nature chakra was offensive supplementary, so it was entirely possible Orochimaru was behind Hyatt's death. It was not damning evidence but Naruto didn't have much else to go on. He knew the Umbu would be investigating it, that Shinobi with more expertise than him would be on the case, but the blonde boy had an unsolved problem in front of him that threatened his home. Naruto had absolutely no idea what he was supposed to do about any of it though. He could not just stay near Karen every hour of the day while they looked for Orochimaru's chakra. Similarly the blonde knew that a long-distance attack from the Sanin was possible. The aspiring Chunin felt a tension he could not find a way to lessen or snap loose from. He wanted to fight Orochimaru to see where he stood after how far he'd come but had no way to initiate such a fight. Naruto knew he was being arrogant, but he was full of nervous energy. More than anything though, Naruto needed to hunt. The depths were as dark, blood-drenched, and full of enough malicious intent that it was like a miasma. Naruto wondered if just breathing the air down deeper would make him more inhuman as ever, as he descended steps while keeping an eye out for traps and an ear out for threats he couldn't help but feel he was descending into another world. It was so easy to put a line between the surface and the dungeons, to pretend they were completely different worlds and that the only thing standing between Kanoha and the monsters beneath wasn't a group of Umbu that technically didn't officially exist. Naruto knew better though because he existed in both worlds and could take things between them. It was the dream that was different, the dream that wasn't entirely real. The Shisha were strange, deformed, shriveled up humanoids but they were apparently there to help. The doll was confusing at times, but she seemed to love Ryoshi, 
that she seemed compelled or built to do so made the blonde feel bad for her. It also made the blonde Jenin wonder about free will. This place is making me a philosopher. He grumbled as he stalked down an empty hallway towards where he first met Maburoshi. He had not seen the other Ryoshi in a while, but he hoped she just tended to hunt deeper than he normally went. The dungeon really was a maze. Sometimes it went up or down. Sometimes it looped back on itself in strange ways, but it was never only dead ends. Also as far as Naruto could tell the dungeon only shifted whatever depth it was at, so if he explored the same depth long enough he started to get a feel for the rooms, passageways, and how the traps were generally laid out. Naruto had taken to using Kaige Bunshin to scout more, it lessened his risk of dying and let him multitask and explore more at a time. Rarely a new kind of trap took one by surprise which could have been an embarrassing death to add to the list so the blonde figured he was making the intelligent choice. More often they were dispelled by Yaju. They gave as good as they got but unfortunately Kage Bunshin could only take one hit. Naruto started to realize his usual fighting style was a little reckless, but in his defense he was immortal and aggressively attacking whatever hurt him to spill their blood into his open wounds was encouraged by his physiology. Kage Bunshin dispelled in one hit though in exchange for their usage in scouting and the fact that they actually were just as powerful as their creator they were sort of fragile. Naruto was pretty sure Mizu Bunshin went down in one clean hit too, but they could actually last a moment after the hit to act as body blockers or give the illusion of having struck the original for a moment which implied they might only dispel with mortal wounds since he'd only ever actually seen them take mortal wounds. Naruto did not know how to make Mizu Bunshin though, from what he recalled Zabuza used the tiger hand sign to make them. The blonde wondered if he could make one with blood as he crept along the ceiling in the blind spot of one of the bear-sized wolves with human thumbs and spindly limbs, his left hand on his hat to help ensure it stayed on. The blonde Ryoshi dropped and extended his blade to slam the cleaving edge into the back of the Yaju's neck. He glanced around from his new position to make sure nothing else was in the area also watching the prey he had been stalking that dispelled one of his bunshin. Naruto folded his weapon, holstered it, and made the tiger sign as the blood pooling below the corpse he'd made reached his feet. He did not know what to do from there though. He tried pushing his chakra into the blood, willing it to make a more sturdy bunshin for him. To his credit the blood did slosh around and lift up under his power, but did not take a shape he wanted, or anything that could be called a shape for that matter. Ninjutsu is hard. Naruto muttered dryly. What are you doing? Jiraiya asked, either surprised to see his new student early for their meeting, already training, or walking on water. He just had no idea what Jutsu the boy was trying to do, which meant he was probably doing a bad job at it, and needed instructions. That or Naruto was just throwing around water. I'm trying to learn Mizu Bunshin no Jutsu. Is this the right hand seal? He asked curiously. Jiraiya nodded yes, he answered. Where did you see that and why are you trying to do it? he asked. Naruto shrugged, Zabuza Momochi and I'm trying to expand my toolkit I guess, he said. Jiraiya shook his head in bewilderment, Naruto was effectively a sponge. He could tell the blonde continued training a lot outside of their lessons due to the improvements the boy made, but he was still surprised at how quickly the blonde's chakra control had improved. Wait, Jiraiya realized, have you been having your Kage Bunshin do chakra control exercises? he asked. Naruto had to think about it with a confused expression before he nodded, technically yeah, water walking is good mobility and sticking to walls and ceilings is kind of fun. He confirmed, not wanting to specify why his Kage Bunshin got so much practice doing that. That explains so much, do you have them practice ninjutsu too? Naruto's eyes widened as what was being implied sunk in, wait that counts as training. He asked as what that meant sunk in, he had been having his Kage Bunshin use their own Bunshin and Kawarimi fairly often, and that one Kekai Ninjutsu he'd been practicing as well. Jiraiya nodded but frowned when he noticed the glint in Naruto's eyes. Wait, it's dangerous. The stress could make you pass out or kill you if you use too many doing different things. He warned. Naruto had no way to explain that both of those were off the table so he just pouted and made mental notes to train with Kage Bunshin more. Anyway, Misa Bunshin is sweet done, your wind aligned. Jiraiya pointed out, 
If you want to expand your ninjutsu library I'll teach you how to turn your hair into spikes that you can use for offense or defense. He offered. How do you use them for defense? Naruto asked. Offensively. Jiraiya answered with a smirk. On his way home Naruto saw Tenten going into the hospital. He presumed to visit someone and figured he'd join in. His mind went over what he'd learned of metallurgy and the Noko Juritsu since they last spoke. He thought he had a perfect solution. Tenten jolted in surprise when she turned towards the stairs and caught the blonde in her peripherals. Fuck, you are stealthy for someone dressed in orange. She complained, embarrassed with her own detection abilities. Sorry, Naruto apologized with a smirk. I was in your blind spot, didn't even consciously think of it. He confessed, no longer overly bothered that he subconsciously did something like that because at least it was useful for being a ninja and didn't seem inhuman. Visiting bushy brows? He asked. Tenten nodded with a frown. Likuin got pretty badly messed up. The Iria ninja don't seem to think he'll recover. She informed the blonde as they ascended the stairs towards the floor Lee was on. Naruto frowned. That's but his taijutsu was amazing. He muttered sadly. He barely knew the guy but Rock Lee seemed like a good person and losing his taijutsu from active duty was a shame too. Yeah, Tenten agreed morosely. Those Suna Genin are baked mano. She grumbled, recalling her own fight against Tamari and all the broken bones Kankuro had inflicted against the older Konoha Jenin. Misumi had apparently already made a full recovery though, so breaking bones cleanly was clearly easier to heal than the injuries caused by sand implosion. No. Naruto denied with a shake of his head, their jerks, he corrected, Gara is the bake mano. He smells different, carries himself different, even the way he fights is different. He explained, Tenten decided not to point out that all of those could be said of the blonde speaking too. There's something off about him, mentally too. You can see it in his eyes. Even when he's hiding his expression his eyes are always the same eyes of a yaju. Tenten had not been aware Naruto was so observant, but she supposed he had actually made it to the finals while she had not. This bothered her a little. She wanted to be the cool older senpai that showed how weapons were really used. Temari had quickly put a stop to that, mostly because the Kanoha Kunoichi didn't have a weapon heavy enough to engage a test in the size wielded by the Suna Kunoichi. Tenten finally noticed something, not carrying that Nokajiri today? She asked curiously. Naruto pulled out a scroll, I've been learning Fuinjutsu. He explained, I can enclose things in scrolls now, and make my own Kabaku Fuda, he said proudly. Tenten was surprised by that more than anything because she was pretty sure she knew Naruto had difficulty with book work. I thought you had trouble with writing stuff down or reading? She asked. I can't read kanji. Naruto confessed with a shrug. The few arrays aren't really kanji though anyway. He pointed out. Tenten's eye twitched since most people considered few arrays and symbols harder to read than kanji. You got this far without being able to read kanji? She asked incredulously. Naruto shrugged again. Most things are in hiragana or katakana. He pointed out, I can read ramen, ichiraku, my name, ninja, gen, tai, jutsu, and a shuriken is made up of te, yura, and ken. He listed. Wow, you're as poorly educated as a child soldier from a minor clan during the Sengoku Jidai. Tenten realized blandly, how did that ever happen? She wondered. Naruto seemed confused by something else. Is a punching dagger a shuriken? He asked. What? Tenten asked incredulously. It's a blade concealed in the hand. Naruto pointed out, Te Yura Ken Shuriken. He listed the individual words to clarify why he asked. Tenten had not considered that, technically yes, but no one calls them that. She realized, generally a shuriken refers to the kind you throw. She pointed out, now that she thought of it she was pretty sure that outside of niche situations, like the punching dagger, that would be the only use for blades small enough to conceal in the hand. Naruto frowned, huh, I wonder how big a fuma is. He mused. Tenten rolled her eyes, come on, that's just a name. The name of a clan of ninja, not a clan of bake mano or whatever. She clarified, they probably did make that shuriken really big to imply what you were thinking though. She guessed with a shrug as they approached Lee's room. Naruto nodded. The mention of them inventing the Fuma Shuriken reminded him of something though. I think I know what alloy to use for my Noko Jiritsu. 
he said. You're what now? Tendon asked, concerned that he named the weapon while still figuring out the alloy. Quicksilver and steel, Naruto said from what he'd read it made it flexible. Tenten halted. Where are you going to get mercury? Why do you want to use mercury? She snapped as she stumbled to continue keeping pace with the blonde. Naruto frowned. It'll work. He insisted. He already knew it did. I've found the, uh, ratio to keep the quicksilver stable at room temperature while maintaining flexibility in the alloy. He explained. He was pretty sure the cord in the center of the nokojuritsu was made of such a material too. No one was going to believe he finished it in a month though which unfortunately meant his new weapon was relegated to a hunting weapon only for now. Tenten gaped at the blonde. You already found the ratio? She asked, disbelief obvious in her tone. Naruto just nodded and she shook her head. How did you not get poisoned? She wondered. The blonde did seem to have lost some of his tan somehow, but he wasn't blue-lipped or fingered, nor did he seem poisoned. Naruto rolled his eyes, safety equipment. He lied but the kunoichi bought it. Then his blue eyes widened as he smelled something rotten on the floor, in Lee's very room. Tenten jolted in alarm as the blonde took off towards Lee's room. She dashed after him in time to see him collide with Gara, or more accurately with Gara's sand. The kunoichi stiffened and went pale, but Naruto seemed oddly unafraid of the sand as he glared at the auburn-haired boy. Seeing them close and staring each other down, Tenten realized that Naruto and Gara were roughly the same height. Despite being taller than both of them herself, the Kunoichi felt like she was staring into a room with two apex bake mano fighting over the unconscious form of her crippled teammate. They weren't fighting yet or making the kinds of sounds associated with bickering animals, but it didn't seem to matter. Tenten realized it was in the body language. Gara's was too calm, but the sand covered for it. While Naruto was giving off subconscious killing intent despite the sand dangerously coiling around his lower body, what do you think you were about to do? The blonde asked. I intended to kill him, Gara answered honestly and tonelessly, when out of nowhere you attacked to interrupt. Why? He demanded to know. Naruto reared back his left fist, focused his chakra, and slammed a haymaker at Gara that was intercepted by the sand. A ringing, Chiming sound echoed from the gauntlet pilfered from the Odo Genin, and the Kaomi Isupika was used properly by the blonde for the first time since he got it. Gara stumbled back, clutched his head, and groaned as his sand wavered, pulled away from Naruto and swirled around like it was trying to find the source of the current agony Gara was in. Tenten's eyes widened, get back! She warned as she rushed Lee's bed and hit the emergency button while the Suna Genin was still recovering. Gara reacted to the movement. He reached for Tenten and the sand followed. Naruto leaped towards the green-eyed boy, focused his chakra, and punched with his left fist again, and again the Kaomi Isupika released sounds into Gara that bypassed his defenses to hurt him directly. The sand swirled more violently. Gara screamed as his glare fell on Naruto. His conscious mind finally clicked that the blonde was the threat as Tenten lifted Lee out of bed and pulled the waking, groggy boy away from the sand while being mindful of his casts. The sand crashed into Naruto and slammed his back to the wall before he could Kawarimi. Damn it. Fucking coward, he growled, trying to push against the sand but for all his supernatural strength the sand was downright supernatural itself. Whatever else Naruto was going to say was interrupted by Mado Guy's arrival. The man with eyebrows so bushy they made Lee's look almost normal again interrupted the sand from crushing a genin to death. To his relief the blonde wasn't crippled so he made it in time this time. Are you trying to get yourselves disqualified? Guy asked both of them before he glared at Gara. Or just trying to get yourself killed before the finals? He asked the auburn haired boy threateningly. The sand collected back to Gara and the Suna Genin left without a word. Tenten sighed in relief and helped Lee back into his bed. Ah, thank you for the assistance, Tenten san and Naruto san, Guy sensei. He said tiredly, vaguely understanding he'd been saved from a dishonorable end somehow. Guy nodded, yes, thank you, Naruto-kun. He added his own gratitude, only to notice the blonde boy staring down at the gauntlet on his left arm. Naruto grinned as he looked up, no problem, I think I have a way to beat Gara now. He said happily, the Kaomi Isupika, for some reason or another, actually was copied by Kage Bunshin. He still didn't know how his chakra or the jutsu decided what did or didn't get copied, 
but he did know that he just figured out a very useful weapon. Tenten frowned at the gauntlet. Wasn't that on that Odogeku Jenin? She asked. Naruto nodded. I killed him in the forest of death and took it. He explained. Guy raised an eyebrow. His Jonin commander hasn't tried to recover it from you. There are systems in place of him to do so. He pointed out. Naruto had not been aware of that because no one had approached him about it. Well, he didn't, so it's mine now. He insisted. Are you going to reverse engineer it? Tenten asked curiously, intending on trying to do that herself. Naruto considered it, which told the three other ninja that he had not yet considered that, yet probably you know. He decided as the nurses arrived to help double-check Lee, then the blonde rushed off to go train with his new working tool. Guy raised an eyebrow, an excitable one, isn't he? He mused and Tenten nodded in agreement. Enko remained perfectly still and resisted the urge to fidget. She was pretty sure she was not in trouble but Yuga was Umbu and might have possibly dabbed her into the Hokage. In case that was not actually the case she would keep a straight face and pretend nothing was wrong. The Sandame looking less than amused did not help Enko's urge to fidget. What is your relationship with Naruto Uzumaki? He began and the woman resisted the urge to flinch that you would leak information on an ongoing investigation of the death of a proctor to him while he is supposed to be training for the finals? He asked. Anko could not tell the truth and she didn't know how much the Hokage knew, but she was an elite kunoichi so she came up with the perfect lie. I want to take him as an apprentice. She declared proudly, the lie was perfect because it was completely honest and hid everything else, it was a deflection. Hiruzen saw through it and raised an eyebrow, Naruto-kun has Kakashi Hataki as his jonin commander, and Jiraiya, my own student, is currently tutoring the boy to my understanding. He pointed out, why do you want to take him as an apprentice? Anko shrugged, because he's crazy. She said simply, he hasn't had a normal upbringing, not to make light of his situation or how you had him raised, but he's a bit messed up if you hadn't noticed. She pointed out. Hiruzen frowned, I am well aware. He muttered, his thoughts drifting to what could have happened the day Naruto painted the monument. He had a jutsu to scry long distance with a crystal ball, but the range was limited and going through solid stone hindered that range further. Water seemed to interfere too for some reason but that rarely was an issue. Danzo's story did not quite add up, but Naruto said it was true and the boy showed no signs of being manipulated by the retired shinobi to all the Sandame's disbelief. Naruto didn't even seem to understand the threat Danzo posed from what he'd heard from Kakashi. Enko just nodded again. Well, I can sort of relate to him, I guess. So I want to take him as an apprentice when he makes Chunin. She insisted. Haruzen was still suspicious, but it did make sense given the situation with Mizuki was vaguely similar to what Orochimaru had done, albeit on a smaller scale and Mizuki was far less dangerous. Your situations are different. He pointed out. Enko shrugged, so? No one has the same situation. She retorted, I think he'll be strong, so I want to help with that. She explained with a grin. Haruzen nodded, we'll see. He said, not agreeing with her nor denying with her. Enko's grin widened as she got away with what she was actually doing, and made a mental note that Yuga was a good person but not to be trusted with dark secrets. Naruto noticed sounds a lot more. A bell chimed to take him to the dream. He realized he could hear something vaguely similar, but more drawn out and distant, whenever the doll imbued him with Chi no Ishi. He also noticed himself reacting to sounds others didn't, but it wasn't until he saw Kiba again when he and Akamaru both turned in the direction of a noise that someone else noticed. Kiba raised an eyebrow at the blonde. Did you hear that whistle? He asked. He knew from how Akamaru had shifted that had been a dog whistle. Not even Inazuka could hear that without using one of their hijitsu. Naruto nodded, yeah, what is it? He asked as he made the assumption that the other genin heard it too. Dude, Kiba said with a wry smirk, that's a dog whistle. He said and Akamaru barked in confirmation, that's not a pitch most people can hear. He pointed out. Naruto stiffened with worry, concerned about the blood and the yaju, must be a kitsune thing. He muttered the excuse mostly for his own benefit. Ninjio-chan, am I becoming a yaju? Naruto asked when he opened his eyes to the dream that night. The thought had plagued him for a while. No. The doll answered plainly and the blonde boy calmed a bit, 
As long as you hunt Yaju, you are Ryoshi. She added and the genin deflated slightly. He needed weird blood to be a Ryoshi to his knowledge and that made him, at the very least, not a ninjin anymore. Humanity or inhumanity, there was no denying his lack of mortality. Naruto was starting to realize the doll was a little biased towards Ryoshi, but he supposed that made her biased towards him which felt kind of nice. Is that the condition of my immortality? He wondered, recalling the words of the crazed old Ryoshi who had ministered the old blood to him. Not quite. It is just what you must do to fulfill the conditions. The doll answered. Naruto's eyes widened. What are the conditions? He asked. I do not know. The doll answered with a frown. The other Ryoshi have never spoken of it. Perhaps they wrote of it in their journals? She suggested. Naruto had never read about it, so the fact his immortality was conditional had slipped his mind. Stranger was that the doll knew hunting was not the condition, but it fulfilled conditions that she didn't know about Arcane. He grumbled at the mystery. Everything about the dream and his immortality could be described as an arcane mystery to be solved so he understood why that word was used to describe the intelligence-boosting attribute. You wish to become more arcane, good Ryoshi? The doll asked, offering out a hand. Naruto waved her off. Maybe when I get more Chino Ishi. He mused. H.M., well, someone is looking at your body. The doll informed him as she retracted her hand, watching the young Ryoshi scramble for the tombstone that would return him to his apartment. Naruto expected it to just be Anko, but the idea of her getting at him while he slept bothered him, so when he saw Gara, he was more than a little alarmed. The auburn-haired boy's eyes widened at the sight of Naruto jolting awake as if he had some way to detect his presence. Sand rushed the blonde, crushing a log against the bedding in a puff of smoke. Naruto punched his left fist at Gara from behind as he focused his chakra. The Kaomi Isopika screamed as fist met Sand and the Suna Genin staggered. Naruto heard a banging on his door so he made a pair of Kage Bunshin and leaped straight at Gara as one of his Bunshin went to the door and another circled around the other side. Shuriken made of sand lashed out across the room, taking out the bunch and circling Gara and knocking the original sprawling. The other Kage bunch and opened the door and tackled Karen out of the way of a stray Suna Shuriken. What? The red haired Uzumaki exclaimed her question, her tone alarmed as she looked at the fight between the two. Jiraiya appeared in a cloud of smoke and put a hand on Gara's shoulder. The sand fell still. From what I heard, the sanding began. This is the second time you two skirmished. Can't you wait a month, brat? He asked Gara with a glare. The Suna Genin was having a minor internal panic attack. How did you do that? He asked quietly, eyes on the hand on his shoulder. Fuinjutsu disrupted your connection with, Jiraiya considered it, ah, uh, that monk right? The one who was said to control sand? Shikaka wasn't it? He asked as he recalled the legends. He wasn't sure how accurate they were but the boy was controlling sand. You made Hahaya quiet. Gara muttered simply, not answering the question at all as he continued to stare passively at the hand on his shoulder. All right, Jiraiya made a decision. I might be busy. Good luck with your Chunin exams finals if I don't see you before them. He said to Naruto before he left with Gara in custody. Why was Gara trying to kill you? Karen asked. Kaomi Isupika. Naruto said as he held up his left arm. Sand can't block sound waves. If he can hit me first I'm in trouble, but the sound messes up his control over the sand so this thing gives me an edge. He explained, I learned that when I found him trying to kill Rock Lee, so he learned that too, and now he hates me because I can hurt him and he's a coward who is scared of getting hurt. He said the last part with some venom. Karen stared incredulously at the gauntlet. That's convenient. The one shinobi tool you need to fight Gara was here at the same time as him. Seems to be a prototype from another village, and you managed to pilfer it? She asked. Naruto nodded, yeah. I don't think it's luck though, well not all luck. He said as he frowned at the mess he needed to clean now. I think Kaomi Isupika was designed for it, to go through defenses like Gara's. The Odo Jinin seemed to have something to prove, and I think from what Jiraiya said that Gara might be a Jinshuriki too, although with some monk or something? He wondered what the deal was with that. I think they were sent to kill Sasuke so Konoha wouldn't have an Uchiha, and kill Gara so Sunagaker knows Sato wouldn't have him anymore. He guessed. You think you stumbled onto an assassination plot? 
Karen asked. Sure, Naruto answered with a shrug, why not? He pointed out and the redhead was inclined to shrug her agreement with that sentiment. Ninja dealing with assassination was like firefighters dealing with fire. Either way, I have a useful tool on my arm here. More to play with. And I'm learning more jutsu. He said smugly. I'm so ready for the finals. He finished proudly. Chapter 21 Fighting Like Ninja The day of the Chunin examination's final phase finally arrived. Naruto's old jacket was fully repaired and he proudly wore it with the sleeve up on his left arm to display Kaomi Aisupika. He was glad Hinata managed to repair it in time, surprised too. Thanks to his newly learned fuinjutsu the blonde seemed oddly less armed than before, although he'd adopted the bandolier from his hunting outfit for the exam to hold the dozen small scrolls he had prepared. Any ninja that knew a fuinjutsu understood that Naruto was likely the most heavily armed genin down there, excessively so. Surprisingly Gara was there and Sasuke was not. Naruto had not seen his team since they'd split up to train for the finals. Sakura didn't look too different. A tanto on her hip. A bit more armored than usual with some mesh, and she had similar armored fingerless gloves that a few shinobi used, like Kakashi and Naruto. No one else had changed their outfits much, while Sakura had even kept her hitai over her forehead and had her hair done up in a bun. Naruto looked at it a few times, trying to figure out how all of her hair was contained and condensed like that. In the stands Ino saw Sakura's parents for the first time in a while. Mabuki looked annoyed with her husband Kizashi, who had pinwheels in his hitaite and was still in uniform. The Yamanaka felt awkward talking to them and sat with Asuma and Choji where the competitors would be waiting their turns when they were done standing in the middle of the arena with the new proctor. Karinai, Hinata, and Kiba were there as were the Jonin commanders of Suna and Aim whose Jenin had made it to the finals. Guy stood between the Suna Jonin and the rest of the Kanoha ninja, Tenten sat with Lee. To the surprise of no one Karen joined them, to the surprise of a few of them Anko joined them. Karinai raised an eyebrow, Anko-san, it's nice to see you, but why sit with us? She asked. Anko sighed, I'm not allowed to bet, and hearing Izumo and Kotetsu, you know those two Chunin who are always together and helped out at Biki san They won't shut up about how much they wish they could bet on an easy win in the first round but couldn't because they were proctors, she explained. She agreed with them but it was still annoying, so I came to sit with the others who can't bet and are more likely to talk about jutsu than whatever gambling odds I'm missing out on. She finished with a huff. There was another man that none of the other genin recognized. What about you, Abisu san Asuma asked curiously. Ebisu adjusted his shades. Hataki-san called in a favor, so I tutored Sakura Haruno. I am curious to see how she stacks up against her opponent using what I taught her. He said stiffly. Haruzen wasn't sure what to expect from Amagekure. Hanzo was a dangerous person that even the Sandane wasn't certain he could defeat without losing his own life. But the man in question was also cautious and had reportedly become something of a shut-in. So the Hokage was not surprised to see the Amagekyu no Sato delegation did not include the Shinobi Gashira himself, even if it was technically a slight. The delegation was a simple three ninja affair, all gray cloaks and straw hats. The apparent leader of the group stood out for his willingness to look the Sandame Hokage in the eye more than any physical feature. Hokage Dano, the leader of the delegation greeted with a bow, it is a pleasure to be welcome in Kanahagakur no Sato for such an occasion. He said politely, I believe the genin of ours who came this far was Hanbei, correct? He asked. Haruzen nodded, indeed, he did well among this crop of genin. He praised idly. The man smiled, he is quite proficient in battle, I hope his temperament is fit for promotion though. He commented casually as he made his way to his assigned seat with his guards. The man sat where Hanzo had been expected to sit, which was technically not right with the kage. The Gokage were considered on another level, lords by merit of ability, warlords of their daimyo. Shinobi Gashiro were respected, but not to the same degree, and nigh every minor hidden village wished to make it the Rokage or usurp one of the Gokage positions. The Kazakage arrived with his delegation of two Shinobi guards next, but there was still no sign of Kakashi. The Sandame Hokage decided some small talk would buy them time, ah well well, Kazakage Dano. Hiruzen greeted. The other Kage was fully covered up in his robes and hat with a veil over his face, 
You must be tired from your long journey. He commented. Oh no, I'm happy to make the trip. The Kazakage denied, of course, you're still hale and hearty, but the trip might have been much harder on you, Hokage Dano. He ribbed lightly. Perhaps you ought to choose a successor soon, he suggested. Haruzen laughed. Well, don't bury me yet. I hope to continue for another five years at least. He retorted before he stood. He could not small talk for too long after all. Ahem, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, welcome and heartfelt thanks for gathering here in Kanahigakur no Sado. He began to call out loudly for the audience in the stands to hear him, for the Chunin selection examination. We will now begin the final round between the ten candidates who advanced to this stage. Please sit back and enjoy. He announced with a smile, proud that so many of the finalists were from Kanoha, though with the sheer number of applicants, and being the host that was to be expected. Ten candidates? The Kazakage questioned, one seems to be missing. He said dryly, seemingly concerned with the missing Uchiha. The Hokage was concerned as well. The possibility that Orochimaru had done something to the heir of the Uchiha clan was likely. Haruzen could only hope Kakashi knew what he was doing. If the man had inflicted the boy with his tardiness, then the Hokage intended on having words with the Jonin. The new proctor turned to face the nine genin who were present. Listen up, all of you. This is the last exam. He began, the landscape may be different, he said and Naruto glanced around. It seemed like the arena had been built around one of the parks. But just as with the prelims there are no set rules. You fight until one of you dies or admits defeat. He continued, unless I determine that a winner is obvious, in which case I'll stop the match before someone is killed, understand? He finished with an opening for questions. Naruto frowned, Sasuke isn't here yet, so what's going to happen there? He asked, he was curious about fighting his teammate, he was not entirely sure why he was so eager to see how he matched up against the other boy. If he isn't here in time for his match, he'll lose by forfeit. The proctor explained, and when no further questions arose he continued, All right then, the first match between Naruto Uzumaki, he said and the blonde turned to face his opponent, and Niji Hyuga is set to begin. You two stay down here, the rest of you go to the waiting area in the stands. He finished and the other seven genin cleared out as Naruto and Niji took positions across from each other. Naruto figured he should probably buy some time for Sasuke. They were teammates and supposed to help each other, you know. It's weird to me that everyone seems to think the odds are against me. He mused, can you even actually hit me? He asked as he crossed his arms and raised an eyebrow. He knew his smirk was more cocky than he had right to be, but that was intentional. Niji's eye twitched, you think you can fight me without getting hit? He asked rhetorically as he took a taijutsu stance. Naruto hopped a step back and his hands flashed into the cross seal. From the smoke came five of him, each one split, made the ram seal, and then there were fifty of the blonde genin surrounding Niji. The Hyuga activated his Byakugan to confirm only five were solid, but the chakra distribution was even between those five and they all had Kirakukiai so he had no idea which one was the original. Those forty-five bunshin are worthless, I know only five of you are corporeal. Niji taunted. All of the Naruto's grinned, so you can't tell which one is the real me? One of him asked, really now? Another continued with a chuckle, how unfortunate, and you're a taijutsu expert too. Another pointed out, I spent the last month perfecting my ninjutsu, shurikenjutsu, and bukijutsu. A fourth spoke sternly, you can't touch me unless you can use hashiman or overwhelm me with sheer speed. The fifth Naruto to speak did so tonelessly. Niji scowled angrily before he took a deep breath and sighed, I see. So you think because I specialize in Juken that you can simply avoid encountering me in direct melee? He asked. Every ephemeral bunshin disappeared and the five remaining Naruto pulled out shuriken. Yes. Five voices said before each Naruto threw a shuriken then made the bunshin seal. Kaige shuriken no jutsu. He declared. Haruzen's eyes widened. That was his jutsu. He did not begrudge Jiraiya teaching it but he had not expected to see it from Naruto despite his usage of Kage Bunshin. Creating constructs of the small weapons mid-flight was far more difficult than evenly splitting one's chakra. I need to learn those jutsu. Tenten muttered, trying to get a better a look at the hand seal Naruto was using. The jonin were all surprised at the sheer scale Naruto could put out, 
while Anko just smirked as if she expected it. Niji's eyes widened because he was surrounded by walls of spinning blades coming at him, and they were all corporeal even if all but one of them were pure chakra. The Hyuga spun on one foot and flared his chakra, Katen, he declared. The eyes of the Hyuga in the audience, namely Hayashi, Hinata, and Hanabi, all widened in surprise that Niji could perform that taijutsu. Katen was only taught to main house heirs, and Hayashi had yet to teach Hinata so Niji could not have been privy to lessons meant for someone else, which meant the boy had reverse-engineered one of the Hyuga's Haiden a rank taijutsu. Naruto watched the shuriken bounce off and dispel. One physical metal star hit the ground and bounced before skidding. Do you have any idea how little of my chakra I just used to do all that? He asked with a raised eyebrow. How much chakra does that take you? He asked. Niji narrowed his eyes at the blonde. I will not be caught off guard by your jutsu again. He insisted. Naruto knew he shouldn't but he did the exact same thing and each of him threw a single shuriken before making more. This time they seemed to shred Niji, but each Naruto focused his chakra as a log hit the ground and the Hyuga Genin struck one of the blondes from behind. The older Genin scowled as he saw a ram sign and in a puff of smoke a log hit the ground. Niji moved as Shuriken came flying at him from different angles. The fight became chaotic as he tried to get in close using Kawarini but each time he was countered by Kawarini. He still had no idea if he had struck the real Naruto or had only attempted to hit his Kage Bunshin so far because he couldn't tell the difference. Then the bolus came flying at the Hyuga and the boy narrowly avoid being struck. In the chaos Niji lost sight of a Naruto until one of the bolus transformed into the blonde himself dual wielding bolus that he threw into Niji's dodging path before he rolled off his shoulder to a crouch with his hands in the ram sign. A log hit the ground as Niji hit the Naruto who threw the two bolus at him in the back of the head. Then another log hit the ground and Niji leaped away to avoid another volley of shuriken. Holy shit, Naruto is like an entire cell. Ino praised in awe, that jutsu is so powerful. She pointed out. Ebisu adjusted his shades, Kage Bunshin no jutsu, powerful, and an ingenious use of it. A pity few ninja can make such use of it, you would need monstrous reserves for them to last so long, and split-second reactions to perfectly time each kawarimi like that. He praised, surprised the blonde was doing so well. Shikamaru smirked, I'm more impressed with Niji. He pointed out to his teammates' surprise, Naruto doing this is scary and impressive, but Niji doing so well in this situation is scary in its own way. He pointed out, I don't think I'd be able to beat Naruto like this actually, guessing which one is the real him and nabbing him in my shadow. That unpredictable guy. As if. He finished with a scoff. Sakura was baffled. How did this happen in a month? She wondered quietly. The chaotic dance continued until Niji finally lost stamina and faltered. The hail of Shuriken cut off and the Hyuga boy staggered out of the path of the remainder of the last volley. You dare pity me? He asked breathlessly. Naruto frowned at the other boy. Honestly, I hate you. He said bluntly. Hanada-chan asked me not to, but the best I can do is not kill you for her. He informed plainly. I want nothing more than to kill you actually, to just rip you to shreds and spill your blood all over the place with that brutal nokojurijutsu you saw in the preliminaries. He confessed I want to do that, but I won't. Because you're not a yaja that needs to be put down, you're just an asshole for some reason. He explained with a shrug I hate you, but I'm not going to kill you for it. You're still a fellow Kanoha shinobi. I am going to humiliate you for what you did to Hinata-chan though. He finished tonelessly. Hinata flushed as Anko and Ino both smirked at her, but Karen snorted, wow, and that is how Aniki treats friendship. She muttered with a shake of her head, then her eyes widened in alarm, oh he is going to kill anyone from Kusa. She realized as the epiphany that he got more upset by people he cared about being hurt than himself due to his immortality hit her. Niji scowled, you continue to stick your snout into business you don't have anything to do with, you damned punk. He snarled angrily. Hinata-chan is my friend, and you hurt her in front of me. Naruto said bluntly, that became my business. He decided simply, the way you acted, the things you said, I know you shouldn't be a chunin. I know I don't technically get a say because I'm still Jinin too, but I do get to have a say by competing with you and showing where you're lacking. He explained, so keep flailing around and proving you don't have what it takes to be chunin you know. He dared, 
his verbal tick returning to the end of the sentence as he glared. When did he become so eloquent? Ino asked. This past month, apparently, Sakura answered. I didn't notice. Karen commented the change had been rather gradual to her. Niji continued to scowl, but he could not think of a way to identify the real Naruto or overcome the jutsu being used against him. How are you not out of stamina? He asked. Naruto blinked olishly. I'm Uzumaki. He reminded, super vitality, something about a healing factor in there too, monstrous chakra, and I guess I'm good with few in jutsu, not that I need that against you. He explained, he also didn't have any few in jutsu that was combat capable outside of prepared kibaka fuda but no one needed to know that but his sensei for now. It was Niji's turn to blink olishly, oh, he muttered, in hindsight he wished he had used kawarimi instead of katen against the first volley of metal blades. You know what, I'm done. He decided. Naruto frowned. What? He asked. He had not finished yet. Yeah, I forfeit. Niji confirmed as he deactivated his Byakugan and lowered his guard. I cannot think of a way to overcome your ninjutsu. You intend to humiliate me further, and I am exhausted. He reasoned. I may hate that fate ordained me to lose here, but I will accept it gracefully. He said. Naruto's eye twitched, fuck you, you don't get to save face here. He refused, take your ass kicking and humiliation like a man damn it. He demanded. No, we're ninja. Niji refuted, I will admit, I think I have to rethink some things. If someone like you was fated to defeat me then I misunderstood a lot. He muttered. I don't even believe in fate. Naruto responded blandly, can he seriously just give up like that? He asked. The proctor nodded. Naruto had not caught the new one's name, of course, if he thinks he can't win it's the smart thing to do. He subtly praised, implying giving up when it was obvious you lost was actually good for this phase. Damn it, I wanted to stall for Sasuke more. Naruto grumbled as he watched Niji leave. He saw a guy up in the stands and left as well. As he moved he registered the cheering. The crowd had finally realized what had happened. The anticlimax of the scene left most of them stunned. That blonde kid actually won. I didn't think Jenin had the chakra to perform Kage Bunshin no Jutsu. It makes sense, given who that is. Sakura felt her head spin. Naruto got the chakra control to handle Kage Shuriken no Jutsu in a month. She muttered, she wanted that ninjutsu too. Kiba frowned. I can't believe Niji just quit like that. He grumbled. Smart thing to do, a tactical retreat. Asuma commented. Impossible in an arena, so the Jonin and Kage judging determine a forfeit as a tactical retreat, since it is using the proctor available and given rules to escape the fight in a way. He explained, we don't generally advertise that, because on the flip side if it's obviously cowardice or seems cowardly to the viewer then it looks worse, but Naruto pretty obviously won that round. He finished as he pulled out a cigarette, at Karinai's glare he did not light it. Haruzan smiled proudly and stroked his goatee, HM, make a note, he told his scribe, Naruto Uzumaki's growth is astronomical. He displayed chakra reserves, control, talent for the shinobi arts in general, and a good grasp of tactics. He dictated to the man who wrote as instructed. The Kazakage chuckled, the crowd is astir. He commented with amusement. Yes, it was a rousing battle. Haruzan agreed proudly. No, the Kazakage disagreed, surprising the Hokage. I believe they are excited for the next match. He corrected, for all the curious Shinobi Gashira and Daimyo, no other match is more highly anticipated. He pointed out, by the way, is he here yet? He questioned. Haruzan frowned since Sasuke Uchiha had not yet shown up. One of his aides suggested that it would be best to announce the forfeit soon before the crowd became too rowdy. The Sandame Hokage felt his age as he sighed. There is no other choice. As the rules dictate we must disqualify Sasuke Uchiha. He said simply. Hokage Dano, the Kazakage interrupted. I ask that you stay the declaration of Sasuke Uchiha's forfeit for now. He requested to the surprise of Haruzan. Forgive me, a scarred aide of the Hokage spoke up. But no matter the level of brilliance, shinobi who lack punctuality are not competent to become chunin. He said plainly and Haruzan briefly considered the amusing idea of demoting Kakashi back to Jenin, unless we provide a clear-cut explanation for the gathered dignitaries. 
I know no reason why we should wait for him. The Kazakage seemed to consider that for a moment, I see, but there is sufficient reason. He spoke calmly. A number of the Shinobigashira here, myself included, came here almost solely to observe that match. He pointed out, the boy is the last of the Uchiha clan, and as Kazakage I beseech you, allow him to face Gara. Haruzan frowned, suspicious of the motives and reasons behind the wording and plea, very well, he decided after a moment. Orochimaru was another matter to consider after all, we will postpone the match to wait for Sasuke Uchiha. Hokage-sama, are you sure? The scar date asked. Haruzan nodded, informed the proctor. He ordered. Yes, sir. The aide obliged, leaving to carry out the command. Haruzan turned back to the Kazakage. Well, you are rarely so insistent, Kazakage-dano. He said while masking his suspicion, why is that? He questioned. If our aim is to show all these potential clients the quality of our village's shinobi, there can be no better opponent than Uchiha. The Kazakage answered simply, How could I pass up such an opportunity? The crowd was getting rowdy already, a few loudly demanding the next fight start already. Naruto and Sakura wondered where their teammate was, Shino just assumed the Uchiha had done the wise thing by avoiding an opponent like Gara. The other Suna shinobi were worried that Gara had in fact gone and killed Sasuke outside of the matches without being caught somehow. The new proctor with the Samban in his mouth was given the instructions and proceeded to carry them out. Everyone. One of the contenders for the match has not arrived yet. He began and Naruto pouted, disappointed that he'd miss out on a chance to fight Sasuke. So, this match will be postponed, and we will proceed with the next scheduled match. He declared and the other contenders were all surprised by that. Well then, the next pairing is Kankuro against Shino Aburame. The proctor continued, please come down. Kankuro frowned, to him the match was trivial and there were mechanisms inside Karasa he didn't want to reveal just yet. The puppeteer exchanged a glance with his blonde sister, I withdraw, he announced, startling the other contenders and arousing suspicion. Tamari unfurled her fan, okay, she said, leaping down to glide on the winds with it. Shino glared at Kankuro the entire time. Well at least you seem willing to fight, the proctor said his tone mocking Kankuro, Shikamaru and Nara, your opponent seems ready. He called. Shikamaru sighed, I really don't feel like it. He grumbled, hey, there's a pattern, why change it? He asked sarcastically. Don't you dare, Ino snapped, I know Yoshino-san is in the audience. She added with a glare. Mentions of Shikamaru's mother brought to mind the frying pan she wielded. The boy shuddered, all right, fine. He grumbled. I was kind of hoping he would. Hanbei muttered under his breath. Li Tenten Gai Sensei. Niji greeted before he sat down. I think I will stay to watch the other competitors. He decided. He didn't have anything else scheduled for now. Also he was too tired to get up again now that he had sat down, but he did not want to reveal that. Naruto waited for Shikamaru at the bottom of the stairs. Hey, Shikamaru, kick her ass. He encouraged as they walked past each other. Also, don't get hit. Wind can apparently cut. She might have held back against Tentenshan to trick someone into taking a direct hit. He warned. Shikamaru decided not to ask where Naruto learned that. Thanks. He said gratefully as he continued his slow walk down to the arena. Tamari looked less than amused with how long he took, which was fair since she just leaped right into cover for her sibling. The proctor chewed his samban impatiently. Is everyone ready for the next round? He asked with a pointed look at Shikamaru. The crowd was clearly growing impatient. A few people had gotten up to get snacks, more than usual but thankfully nothing rowdy yet. Shikamaru sighed, yes yeah, sure, let's go, do our best. He said with no enthusiasm, he really did not want to fight, why'd the other guy quit anyway? Scared of bugs or something? He asked to stall slightly. Mind your business. Tamari said and opened her fan to swing it. Shikamaru used Kawarimi to let a log hit the wall of the arena, then he hid. Nothing happened for a moment, if there's no proof he's in the arena, is there a ring-out countdown? The Suna Kunoichi asked. The proctor shrugged, he need to make an appearance every minute I suppose. He recalled, he was pretty sure that was how it worked. Shikamaru cursed, gave away his position in doing so, and moved to evade the next blast of wind from the Kunoichi. 
Most of the rest of the fight was a game of cat and mouse, with Temari chasing after Shikamaru as the boy evaded her attacks. So when Temari finally hit Shikamaru only for his form to disappear like a common bunshin, the crowd cheered as something interesting happened. Ino was surprised Shikamaru actually did something besides catching someone in his shadows for once, she supposed being forced into a one-on-one -on -one fight pushed the Nara. Temari was surprised she had been fooled by a basic bunshin, and then she caught sight of more. She frowned, not even she had the stamina to play whack-a-mole with bunshin. Worse still the bunshin technically counted as showing his face so Temari had no way to be certain if the real one was even in the same vicinity. There were too many places to hide. Suddenly Temari folded her fun and planted it. Her eyes scanned the area, particularly checking the ground for shadows. There were a few scattered shuriken from the fight with Naruto and Niji, but for the most part she seemed to be safe. You can't catch me with a shadow by hiding. Temari pointed out, I'm not going to destroy your hiding spots to scatter logs and branches for you to use. She added. Shit. Shikamura muttered, irritated that the kunoichi he was up against actually realized what he was trying to do. Well, you can't catch me either. He threw his voice as he shifted, not dropping his guard in case it was a ruse. I don't care. Hiding indefinitely without at least proving your presence might not be allowed. But waiting is. Temari said, glancing to the proctor who nodded to confirm it so I just have to wait for your shadow to come at me and hit you from there. She finished with a smirk. Shikamaru raised an eyebrow as he considered the plan. Technically it was genius. She probably lost points for telling him, and for the plan being to wait around, but he supposed he started it by hiding. The Nara sighed and stepped out of hiding, I quit. He said, continuing the trend, I can't keep up stalling forever, but I think I proved I can stall for a while. A shame I couldn't catch her in my shadow, but she caught on to me. He complained. Asuma was surprised, I guess I couldn't see a way he could win either, but still, I've never seen him lose tactically. I guess it is a fight though and brains aren't everything. He mused before he sighed, a little disappointed his student hadn't gone further. Choji shrugged, you know Shika, even if he saw a way he wouldn't bother if it meant getting hurt. He pointed out, Ino nodded in agreement. Hanbei stood and hopped over the railing without a word, Sakura frowned in concern, Kakashi-sensei still isn't here with Sasuke-kun. She muttered sadly. Naruto only just registered that his sensei had missed his fight and frowned, now that he thought about it Jiraiya wasn't there either. Anko was for some reason, Kakashi is missing his students' fights. Guy commented with a disapproving frown. Asuma sighed, I hope he has a better reason than usual. He muttered. You better go kick that aim ninjas but after taking my place in the finals forehead. Ino demanded with crossed arms. Sakura glared at the other girl. Oh don't worry, I've improved since the preliminaries. She assured confidently as she hopped the railing to meet her opponent. Ebisu smiled proudly. He'd helped the girl build up her fundamentals and worked on her core abilities. As well as where she was lacking while showing her how to use that to supplement what she was good at. Despite the confidence of the tutor Jonin, Sakura herself was struggling not to shake in her sandals. Her opponent was not just bigger than her, he had a bigger weapon, and he was aiming killing intent at her. Naruto occasionally seemed to do that do but not intentionally, she still wasn't used to it being intentionally directed at her even after Orochimaru. Sakura had not been able to afford much more than a tanto, the armor had been gifts from her parents for making it to the finals. They'd been thoroughly impressed and proud she got so far on her first try. Now that she'd gotten so far her father had even mentioned it took him three tries to get that far and another two to actually pass. The pink-haired girl idly wondered if her father knew Kabuto as Hanbei brandished his ninjato, and she swiftly palmed a pair of kanai, ninja wire glinting in the sunlight going from the pommels to her tool pouch. The aim Jin in charged and the Kanoha Kunoichi leaped back, she tossed her left hand kanai out and when it was knocked aside by Ninjato she tugged the wire with the glove of her left hand. As soon as the tip of the kanai sank into the dirt Sakura leaped to her right and loosed more wire. Hanbei noticed what she was doing however and leaped further than she did in response. You think you can catch me with something that obvious? He asked. Instead of a verbal response Sakura answered by way of throwing the kanai in her right hand at her opponent, as she dashed back the way she hopped from with a flick of her wrist. 
Hanbei knocked that kunai aside as well, but he was cautious and leaped back away from the paths of the ninja wire. Sakura palmed two handfuls of shuriken with ninja wire and threw them, a trick she'd picked up from watching Sasuke fight Orochimaru, a trick she'd hoped to show Sasuke. She directed the shuriken but Hanbei managed to evade and deflect them. Sakura made two hand signs and focused her chakra on Hanbei, then while he was distracted by her genjutsu she grabbed the ninja wires and used the combination of eight shuriken and two kunai as a flail, a cock and no jutsu. She declared as if she wasn't just using a glorified flail. The problem with genjutsu was they could be broken, and unfortunately for Sakura her opponent knew how to identify and break genjutsu. Hanbei did just that, evaded the attack, and countercharged the girl who swiftly made the ram sign as he approached. Ninjato swung through the air but a log hit the ground instead of the pink-haired girl the wielder intended, fucking Kawarimi. Hanbei muttered dryly, he glanced over the discarded ninja wire wrapped around the log since the kunoichi couldn't take that with her without giving away her position, let me guess, shit stamina but good control? He assumed from the state of the log and her decision regarding the wires, she could have taken the weapons too if she could extend her chakra that far. Sakura frowned from her hiding spot as she mentally counted how much time she had to show her face. She sent a bunshin out first as she considered her answer and shifted positions in case Hanbei saw through the bunshin. You gonna quit too? Hanbei asked without even charging the bunshin, finally taking off his hat to reveal short black hair. All the losers today have really ticked me off. One of them didn't even fight. He complained, I'm trained to deal with genjutsu, most forms of ninjutsu. Taijutsu, Shurikenjutsu, and Kenjutsu. He explained, I'm prepared to deal with any form of poison you try to use against me, and quite frankly you don't seem to stand a chance. So, you're stalling for the Uchiha? He guessed. Sakura almost nodded before recalling she was hidden and directing her bunshin to do so. Delayed response, Hanbei noted, I'm not talking to the real thing. He mused, his dark eyes scanned the arena. All right, he sheathed his sword and made the tiger seal. Let's have a competition of assassination, if you want to hide. He challenged before his chakra filled the arena with mist, Kirigaku no jutsu. That's just the tiger seal. Naruto asked, that jutsu seemed very useful. He recalled Zabuza doing it but that fight had been almost a blur, so recalling the exact hand signs was difficult for the blonde genin. Yep, Enko answered with a nod, so despite the name... It's not exclusive to Kirigaku no Sato's ninja forces. She explained, still, an assassination challenge? He knows these are exhibition matches, right? She complained. Asuma wished he could light his smoke without angering Kurinai, to a degree, but he's demonstrating a ninjutsu, stealth, and tactical thinking capability. He pointed out, this is a test of who deserves to be Chunin, not who can hit stuff hardest. Sakura could hear her own heartbeat. She struggled to hear anything besides that and the murmuring. She was hidden among the few trees in the arena so the wind rustled their branches and made her tense up further. It was terrifying. The pink-haired Kunoichi tried to control her breathing to keep calm, but she was reminded of Zabuza. She wanted to do better, to win, or at the very least stall for Sasuke and put on a good showing. Every second she remained hidden felt like agony. She couldn't detect her opponent so if he found her and managed to attack without her noticing she was dead. Sweat ran down the back of Sakura's neck, nerves more than anything but that she was nervous was bad. She tried to remain calm as she hesitantly and carefully raised her hands to the ram sign. She knew she would technically be safe if she surrendered but she wasn't actually certain she would be allowed to finish the forfeit from what she felt in the killing intent. You really should have just stayed Jenin for another few years. Hanbei mocked as he slipped his ninjato into Sakura's back. Her eyes widened in alarm as she looked down at the blade sticking out of the right side of her chest. My fight is with your blonde teammate, so I made the wound non-fatal. Learn how to fight by the next time you cross blades with me or I'll put you down for good. He threatened as the mist faded. Hanbei lifted Sakura and tossed her off his blade. The girl tucked her chin and tried to roll but hitting the ground made the hole through her chest and lung hurt. She coughed blood. Iria Ninja rushed in at the signal from the proctor. Hanbei wins his fight. The man declared. Naruto grit his teeth, conflicted on a few things. On the one hand, now he hated Hanbei too. 
On the other hand, he had to be grateful the man wasn't some yaju who cut down people vaguely related to the person he wanted to get back at. He needed to respect that much. The blonde was still clearly angry and glared at Hanbei as Sakura was taken away by the Irian ninja. Karen cast a concerned glance his way. Niji raised an eyebrow. Do you just get angry whenever a female you know gets hurt? He asked. Naruto frowned. Do you not? He asked incredulously. Guy chuckled. Niji-san, you have much more to learn from Naruto-san. He lectured with a hand on his chin. Asuma noticed Karina's look, but before he could intervene and stop her from snapping another voice spoke up. Ah, so you'd throw a tantrum if I got hurt? Enko asked with a sickeningly sweet voice. That's so touching. She crooned. Naruto's eye twitched as his cheeks flushed pink. Where the fuck is Sasuke? He asked through grit teeth. He found Anko's teasing embarrassing enough in private. Secretly, he hoped his teammate did actually get disqualified. Gara deserved some misplaced aggression in Naruto's opinion. As if summoned by the blonde's thoughts to mock his inability to sign contracts to use Kuchio's no jutsu, Sasuke and Kakashi chose that moment to appear in a Konoha Shunshin no jutsu. See, he's here. Gara said the boy knew his team suspected he'd killed the Uchiha.